Hello, and welcome to Jason Cabinets Experience. I'm your host, Jason Cabinets. The Jason Cabinets Experience is brought to you by Cabinets HR. At Cabinets HR, we deliver HR to companies with 49 or fewer people with our HR platform, while also providing you with a dedicated HR business partner. Our guest today is James Marzalak. James, you ready to be great today? Absolutely, man. Let's do it. James is an Army veteran who spent seven years in the Army with 5-1 Cab out of Fort Wright, Alaska, as a scout. He deployed to Iraq in support of Operation Iraqi Freedom, supporting 5th Group Special Forces in the fight against terrorism. His entrepreneurial spirit was formed at 15 years old with the book, The Millionaire Next Door, and spurred several unofficial entrepreneurial projects, starting ironically, ironically basic training from the Army. Currently operating a real estate company at a hedge fund with a mission to end the military housing crisis, help service members get housing ahead of the relocation to avoid long hotel stays, other stresses. James, thank you for being here today. I really appreciate it. It's great to be here, man. How are you? I'm great, James. So this is going to be a great story, great, great conversation. Yeah. Um, so it's always fun how people have things in, in common that are, but not really, they're in common, you wouldn't have to think about it, right? Right. So I grew up in uh, West Texas, Odessa, Texas, overfill, boom and bust. Yeah. And you spent some entrepreneurial time in the Bakken oil. Is it, is it called Bakken? Yeah, Bakken oil fields. Can you tell my experience there? That was a wild time, man. I've been to a couple of places around the world that don't feel real. They feel like parallel universes. And North Dakota was one of those. A gold rush is not something you see very often. And to be on the inside of it, you just see things that you never see anywhere else. I've never seen money move faster. I'm watching guys that come in at $130,000 a year, but they're working 12 hours on 12 hours off for, you know, two weeks. So they're working six months out of the year, but just when they're working, they're working. Uh, I went out there to uh, acquire my CDL which the military helped with, luckily, because I had a military license. Uh, go out there, buy a couple of trucks and trailers, and we're hustling 24-hour shifts. And so we're out here hauling crude oil off of the rigs. And it's not like you're, like, you're, like you're doing engineering or high, it's like just basic, Truck labor, basic labor stuff, right? Yeah, yeah. We're, it's not long haul, so we're staying in a 100-mile radius of Williston, North Dakota. We had a couple of contracts with Halliburton, Suncoast, a couple other players out there. And it's funny, like, like I know in Texas, Texas, like Monahan's, Nido, Texas, always boom and bust. Like, yeah, yeah. when the boom comes, people like buying Calyx houses mm -hmm, they can't afford. Mm -hmm. Like, the bus always come, right? It's yeah, like no one prepares yeah. for it, right? Yeah, You're, you, you kind of ride the wave as far as you can. And that's exactly what I did. So I got in around 2012, 2013, and uh, it crashed in 2015. You know, OPEC sticking their nose into things and price fixing. And, you know, they're very threatened by, you know, I think we're still discovering how much oil the U.S. has. It's a lot. People, yeah, like, like it's like every two years in West Texas, Permian Basin, like it's a new oil yeah, find, like yeah, yeah. new technology. Like yep. we couldn't get behind this rock before. Now we get behind the rock. You That's know? right. That's right. I mean, they're they're madly advancing their technology, uh, and we're one of the only countries in the world that can cap oil wells, which is why you know we have the lowest cost. You know, places like uh, Venezuela, they need ninety dollars a barrel to break even, where we only need, I, I think we only need like forty. 42, somewhere in that ballpark. So we were at the peak, we were doing a million barrels a day. That's insane. I mean, it's just absolutely insane. So, you know, I went out there on a whim and no job, no place to stay. Didn't have my CDL license yet. And four weeks later, I was driving. Yeah. Which was crazy. I miss mean, a great way to get up and get, do the come up, right? You know, you have nothing going on, just yeah. go to oil field and yeah. someone's going to hire you. Oh yeah, absolutely. And, and that was the thing is, you know, everybody was, I mean, rent, for a living room was $1,700 a month, you know, yeah. and, and that's part of it. And so I felt real bad for the real estate investors out there because they were building brand new apartment complexes, hotels. I mean, we're talking like eight story buildings. These were multi, multi million dollar projects. And most of them were 75% complete when it crashed. Yeah. <laughs> like, I mean, rough, thing, you, rough you, day. I mean, look at your history, right? Like, why yeah. you build all these perfect companies? Like, I don't know, Tech, I had friends like who were written like they're like a couch for like $1,000 a month. Yeah, right, right. Because right. they knew if they were in a couch for $1,000 a month, they might be there like eight hours a day, right? Yeah, right. I mean, you, you literally, my life in North Dakota was eat, sleep, work. Mm -hmm. That's it. That's literally all you do. I lived in the truck the vast majority of the time. We were running 90 hour weeks. I had a crew of four out there that were running 24 hours. So the, the rig would call us, you know, the, the top boss would call us, Hey, we need water right now. And we were, you know, you're like a red cycle. You're five minutes later, your wheels up and running. I had a, had a friend, uh, James McGarity, James Garrity, I think his name is, he's a, he's a barber in Texas. He got an idea to like, get this trailer van, refurbish it and put four barber chairs in there. Hell yeah. He would go to Orfield and, you know, just stay out there, you know, 24 seven, 24 seven, you know, 24 /7, you know? <laughs> 
he just had a little caught in there yeah. you know yeah he yeah. made big money right it was it was nuts and watching it crash i mean i watched you know there were 1200 or so drilling rigs by the time that it actually started to crash and four months later it was down to like 12. yeah i mean those things are worth you know tens of millions of dollars mm -hmm. and they just stopped so you might not notice when a bus comes are there like indicators that like people can see okay the bus is coming it was pretty quick for this one. Okay. I, I think sometimes there are indicators, but I saw this whole process go from boom to bust in about three months, four months. Okay. So it was quick. So you got out, got your money, got out of there. I did. Yeah. I was, I was gone. I liquidated all the trucks and, you know, we had to lay everybody off. Yeah. And I'm just like, like, all right, it, what's it, next? I'm pretty sure it's not like back in Orifice, like a place like Seattle, Los Angeles, mm -hmm. you know, pretty, there's probably, nothing else nothing out there. Else, so yeah. I mean, there's, we're talking about North Dakota. Yeah. Right? There ain't nothing out there. You know, the only reason to be there in my opinion, is is the oil fields. And that's, I mean, the entire economy revolved around it. And so, I mean, you could go to work for Walmart for $18 an hour yeah. starting to be a greeter or something like that. I remember you know? just the text, they would start like $25 an hour at McDonald's. Yeah, right, time, right, right. Yeah, the big billboards, you know, come come work for then us. And then $25 an hour at McDonald's, like 200,000 at an oil field, right? That's right, that's right, that's right. And it, it's, it is the truest trickle down effect where even, you know, if you're a waitress, you're making six figures. This is kind of stuff. I remember it came to my mind. There was a story somewhere I read. knew something where there's a barista, and, and yeah, it was somewhere, right? And she just moved to North Dakota, set up like yeah. a brutal barista fan, yep. and was making a freaking just killing. killing. You know, it, everybody is just overflowing with cash. Yeah, you know, and of course, I you know those are like only the probably only four of the few females there, right? Had bikinis yeah. on, you know, oh, absolutely. And, I would too. Come and on. <laughs> remember, it was TikTok. She was on TikTok, right? Yeah, or some yeah. some kind of social media thing. And one time it was kind of funny. This one dude went through there like a, four times a six hour time period, right? Like, dude, are you yeah, kidding right, me? Right? Right. I mean, it, it's kind of like being deployed in, in a way, like everybody's got access to cash, but there's really nothing to spend it on. Yeah. And so when you find something to spend it on, especially if it's a, you know, bikini barista, then you're going to spend it, <laughs> you know? So it was, it was the wildest time of my life. And I think I was left in 2015 going, all right, you know, what do I want to do now? And that's where I have all real estate, which I wanted to get into professionally for a long time. So, yeah. So next, um, just talk about the values for your company, right? Cause I think a lot of founders, entrepreneurs, they do values later down the road, but you do your values pretty early on. I did everything up. Yeah. I, I did everything up front. It was really important to me to define what the vision was, you know, mission, vision values and, and really figure out what's the core infrastructure of who I want to be and who I want everybody, you know, cause it's very important to me that not just me, but everybody from the top to the bottom of my organization needs to opt into that. You know, it's, it's like an employment contract. You need to, you really need to be able to adopt yourself to the values or it's not going to work, you know? So how did you come up with your values? Like, what's your process for that? I had an executive coach for a while and uh, he really challenged me to sit down and think about, and, and we went through a couple of, you know, edits and, and iterations of really thinking deeply, like on a philosophical level, not thinking about who we wanted to be, but thinking about thinking about who we wanted to be, you know? And that's kind of what philosophy is all about. And so we, we really dove into at scale, what is this going to look like? You know, what do we really want to accomplish here? And it, it really forced me to sit back and, and deeply think about what I wanted to be and what values I wanted instilled into the others that were around me. And that kind of put me into a mode of thinking about, well, who do I want to be around? You know, what, what are the classifications of people that, that I really want? What, what character traits do I want them to have? So now I use it as a template to say, okay, this is who I want to be. Where are these people in the orbit in comparison to this? You know, do they, do they hold these traits? You know, can they get on board with this and really, really run with it? So when you bring new people on, how do you make sure that they have the values you want? Or how do you convince them your values are good values? Or do you, or you have it set up where like, they come as, hey, James, I like these values, but can we add this value? Or can we take this value away? How do you work through that process? Yeah, that's the fun part about kind of how I run this organization. So this is the real estate company is my third company and the hedge fund is my fourth. Um, Ray Dalio in his book principles talks about an idea meritocracy. And I, had, I relate to that so hard. When, when I heard this for the first time, it was like the light bulb. I'm like, holy shit, I should have been doing this for all of my companies. <laughs> you know, the idea of meritocracy, the idea of it is all good ideas, the, the best ideas win. It doesn't matter where they come from. And the military was the opposite of that. Good ideas only came from the top, right? Only came from leadership. And if you have good ideas about how to do things better, or hey, you know, we should go right instead of left here, <laughs> uh, there was nobody on the other end. And here, I treat the company like a sandbox where everybody gets a voice at the table 
and I bring together true experts and then I have them debate until we've got the best answer, you know? And so I, I think it's, I'm looking for people that are a willing to fail, which I think everybody is afraid of, right? They, they view failure as a bad thing. I view it as a good thing. Kind of like the, the Elon Musk model, right? Where it's like, we're going to fail as quick as we possibly can to get to the right answer. I, I definitely relate to that. Um, but I think everybody should have a seat at the table. And so I'm, I'm looking for people who are willing to step out and be willing to challenge the status quo. That's probably the most important thing to me. Yeah, my plan in my company is like, whenever I interview people, my plan is like, you know, ask them, well, hopefully they read the value, but kept my values yeah, right. right. Of, of, my, of my values, which one do you agree with? Yeah. Which one do you want to take away? Which one do you want to add, right? Yeah, yeah. Because if you interview someone, they can tell you when their values, like what's going on here, right? Right. And like, I like the Elon Musk, I think it's Elon Musk, he's had the question was, tell me about the time you failed, right? Yeah. And people think it's a trick question, right? Like, right. say you know it's, it's only how you fail, not what do you do to overcome it, right? Mm -hmm. that's, mm -hmm. People don't realize that's a key, like the key to how you overcome there's, that failure. There's something really important I learned in the military, in combat, and it's it's how you judge people. And I don't like judging people, right? That's not a, that's not a good thing to do in, in general. But in this particular case, it's really important. I can say whatever I want to you, right? But I can manipulate what I say. I can even manipulate what I do. Right. I can make you think that I'm doing something that, that I'm really not. But in combat, when the bullets start flying, the man to your left and right have to rely on their muscle memory. They have to rely on their training. So how they respond to that moment in the moment can't be manipulated. It's in it's a visceral, instantaneous response. And you get the real version of somebody's character in that moment. And you see it in other things in life too. Like somebody cuts you off on the freeway. Like I'm in the passenger seat driving with somebody. Somebody cuts them off. Watching them lose their freaking mind and go road rage level. Like that tells me a lot about that person. And not knowing that person might cut you off because the, the, the wife's in the car pregnant. Right. Yeah, right. Wife's in the car. I mean, you never know, right? But There's of course, zero context, it's, right? But then it gets a natural reaction, right? You right. know, like, yeah. So I, I, I've built this thesis that I am watching very closely for how people respond to situations in the moment. And that I found, and it's never let me down, that shows me a person's true character. So somebody posted this on LinkedIn the other day. Uh, this is the CEO of some kind of tech company, the Barry, right? He talked about how this person came to interview. She high credentials uh, from Google. I was great yeah. for a job. And he was like, I'm the CEO. And she was like down talking to me, making fun of me. I'm yeah. like, what in the world? Like, yeah. I can't hire you. If, you. if you're talking to me like That's that, right. how are you going to treat your people, right? Yeah, yeah. And, and like she had a qualifications, but she had, if he, he said, like, if he would not have done the interview, he would have hired her. Like, yeah, based yeah. on paper, reputation and stuff. Yeah. But the interaction he, that she had with those three the people interviewing. Right. Like, and just, like, downgrading them and stuff. Like, what in the world? Like, are you kidding me, right? Like, people give away a lot more than they think they do. Um, in the military, I studied um, microexpressionism, which is a fascinating topic um, about the unconscious facial cues that you give off. And there's, I think, 121 muscles in your face that, unconsciously and subconsciously are going to react. And it, it tells how you're feeling and, and what you're actually thinking. And we use that in interrogations and a whole bunch of other things. But I use a lot in poker, which I think we'll talk about later. Um, and also just in life. I, don't, you know, I didn't need someone to give me the information that I needed in an interrogation. I could do the talking yeah. and watch their responses, and it's it's unconscious. Yeah, especially if you're not trained for it. Yeah, unless you're like a like a master liar, right. master, unless you're common, That's like right. a like, dude, Frank Abagail, mm -hmm, you know, mm -hmm, unless mm -hmm. you're like that, you yeah. know. But, There's yeah. no way I'm reading that guy. Yeah. You know, he that that guy's a pro. He's learned how to suppress that or understand how to manipulate that. But most people, 99% of the community, uh, the the universe doesn't have that ability, and so it, it's a very interesting thing to study. And so I'm I'm watching for a lot of those things because I want to watch out for stuff like that. I'm looking for people who want to come and build each other up. Mm. That's it's the most important thing. Everybody, like we're not here for ourselves. And that also leads into a conversation about things like pay and making sure the people that are working under you are comfortable and not having to think about money. Yeah, you know, that's just one factor of many, but it's like, if you're not focused on how you're going to put food on the table, you're going to be focused on how do we build this thing? Exactly. You know, and I, I'm not here to just be a business and make money. I'm here to build an empire. And to impact, right? I know one time when I, I do the job search seminar, sometimes I always tell people, you know, you have to ask questions to the interview, right? Yeah. One question I recommend and ask to the people interviewing them is like, what do you like and not like in the company? Sure. You'd be surprised how yeah. honest those people yeah, are. Right? Yeah. Yeah. Uh, they'll start build, spilling the beans, yeah. you know, and, and, and like they, they think it's a waste of time to ask them. No, no, trust me. Right. 99.9% .9 of the time, they're going to tell you everything. I wish 
employees would ask better questions in, inter in, in interviews. I do. I, it's very passive where they think I'm there to interview them, but I really do view interviews as it's a two-way street. Exactly. Right. You need to make sure that you're going to fit here because employment is, for lack of a better term, kind of like a marriage. It is. You know, I some mean, marriages think, think end about real it. quick. You think you about know? you spend more time at your job than you do with your wife right. or your husband. Right? Yeah, that's right. That's right. Yeah. And, and I think about investors the same way, right? If, you know, and, and that's how I believe they think about it is, all right, if I'm going to get in bed with this person, you know, I want to make sure that this is somebody I actually want to spend time around. Another, another thing I think Candace do is like, they're interviewing for a job and they'll change everything to be them. Like, yeah, you know, like yeah. you, have, you have to be authentic self, right? Yeah, you know, that's right. Now, don't get me wrong. Economic situation determines you need a job and do whatever, of course, but yeah. Like if you're like, you know, I don't like wearing suits and ties, right. you're going to apply for a job with suits and ties. <laughs> right. Like you're, you're just going to be miserable. Do you really want to do that? I, I'd rather people be their, their authentic self. I want somebody who can naturally be them in, in that space. And that's, it's hard to find. I, I don't think a lot of people have that notion, but it's, I'm looking for that in I, everybody. I think another thing people realize too, like you're applying for a job, the way that company treats you during the hiring process, onboarding process. Yeah. Yeah. That's the best they will ever treat you. Yeah, that's right. So they're treating you like fucking crap. Yeah. It's going to get worse. Yeah, it's that. only going to get, it's, it's only, only going to get from here. And worse. I mean, you think about, you know, there's this huge resignation happening where people are realizing that they actually have more power than they do. Yep. You know, and it's, uh, there's a lot of companies out there that are putting profits before people. And you look at people like, uh, like companies like Zappos, mm -hmm. a pretty good example. And there are others. Um, that are so like Gary Vee, we were talking about yeah. Gary Vee earlier. He's got over a thousand employees and you know, under him. And he's so ambitiously focused on making sure that when he goes through their reviews, yeah, they're talking about performance and all that mm -hmm. kind of stuff, but he spends so much more time on yeah. what are you passionate about? Yeah. What's going on in your life? And, and reacting to that, not just taking the data, but doing something with it. And I'm, I'm very bullish about that as well. I want my employees to be passionate about hobbies and things that they have. And I want them to figure out ways to incorporate that. And I'm going to help them do that, right? And into their job and in, into their life. Yeah, now push back just a little bit. Some employees are taking, taking it like a to, way extreme, right? Because we're oh, talking about, come on, yeah. we're good friend right here. He's like a, you know, he did like a, like a lot of media stuff, live stream for a big corporation in Seattle, right? Yeah. He was in a position. And the position was their job was like go around, plug everything up, right? Yeah, yeah. I mean, obviously I do that in person, right? Right. This person wanted to be virtual. <laughs> And so my friend, like, how are you gonna do this virtually? Right. Well, I can supervise from my house and you hire someone to do it for me. <laughs> and he still wanted the salary, everything like that's like, are you kidding me right now? Like, I have questions. <laughs> yeah. Like, and my friend, like, like, explain me how this is gonna work, right? right you know, right. like maybe I'm missing something, right? Right. But you know, his, his idea was like, I work from home, you hire someone else under me and I'll supervise them, right? Right. There, there certainly is a limit, right? <laughs> like, uh, like, are you kidding me, right? Like, help me understand. Some people do, you know, but that's the other side of it is some people don't get it. So there has to be logic behind it, yeah. right? Everything that we do, my, my director of operations, Steve Lynch is really big about this. Everything we do has to be moral, has to be practical, has to be um, legal. I think the things right now, if you want a job, there's a job out there for you. Oh, sure. It might be a job you want to do, but right. if you like, you're like, you're about to, you know, get kicked out of your house or yeah, something, there's, yeah, yeah. there's a job out there. Plenty for of you. jobs. Yeah. Amazon's hiring everybody. Oh, yeah. I, I just, I, I was talking with somebody that works for Amazon. And uh, they're, they're like, you know, once you get fired or let go from Amazon, mm -hmm. there's a very slim amount of those people that are allowed to come back. Yeah. And so Amazon's like, they burn through a good portion of yeah. the population, you know? And so they're struggling to find people right now because, you know, they're having to open up basically. It's like, yeah. wow, that's crazy. Yeah, I actually use Amazon example. I talk about job search. I said, I know I tell people like, you know, hire fast, hire slow, whatever. Yeah, yeah. I said, I'm not saying like hire me someone in the first day, but right. don't do the Amazon right. Yeah, right. Where like right. you put an application in and six months later, they set up a phone interview, <laughs> right. like a year later, like, you know, like right. don't do that right. Right. Amazon can do that, you know? There's there's a right and a wrong way to do it for sure. And I think, you know, I've, I've worked for other companies before too, you know, before I jumped into entrepreneurship and I saw a lot of flaws. And that's part of, you know, what led me to being an entrepreneur. So James, let's talk about your entrepreneur journey. Sure, sure. How you get started on that? What's the whole yeah. story with that? So, so like you said, in my bio, I think when I was 15, I, I read that, that book, The Millionaire Next Door. And that led me to understand, you know, as a 15 year old, I'm building PCs, I'm playing Xbox, you know, I, I had a job, you know, I, I started when I was 13, I had a business card, one side was mowing lawns. This was in Spokane, so there's a lot of snow. So one side was mowing lawns, one side was sh snow shoveling. And like in the wintertime, I'd wake up at three o'clock in the morning. And this was just my neighborhood, about 190 homes. So I'd go every year and knock, I'd door knock, hand out my card, say, hey, please put this on your fridge. And when you need lawn mowing or 
snow shovel and give me a call. And I had, I had a pretty good client base, but when I turned 15, I got my first job and uh, I read this book and I, I came to realize that money is actually just a tool. It's not a means of buying things. It's not a status symbol. It's a tool. And I built that same thesis around real estate as well over time. Um, but entrepreneurship to me was two things. Either you're inventing things that have never been invented before. You're, you're inventing something brand new or you are finding pockets of opportunity. And every entrepreneurship project or business that I've ever had have been the latter. It's, I, I've never invented anything that's never existed but I'm taking puzzle pieces of what's already there and putting them together in ways that have never been seen before. And it's invigorating. It's so much fun. And I'm in basic training in the army. And this, this is what I consider my first unofficial entrepreneurship project. On Sundays, there was only one drill sergeant on duty. This was in Fort Knox. And his feet were kicked up in the day room watching football because he didn't want to be there. You know, Sunday was kind of a, we're writing letters, we're cleaning, you know, stuff like that. And I was in a military type program before Civil Air Patrol. And so I was, you know, it's not like I was used to everything. Not that it's not the real military, but like I knew facing movements. I came in a lot more comfortable than some of these guys who were coming in cold. They didn't really have any experience. They're just like, yeah, we're going to join the army. Should be fine. But they're hurting. They, they don't have the comforts of real life magazines and candy bars and food. They're, they're getting smoked every day. They're just not loving life. And so I would sneak out on Sundays just once and I would go buy, I would go to the commissary, which was about four blocks away. And I would buy all the candy bars I could fit in my pockets. Magazines would be stuffed inside my uniform and I would come back within 10 minutes. I'm selling magazines for 25 bucks, candy bars for 10. And I walked out of basic training with like 4,500 bucks in cash. And I never got caught and other people tried to copy me. They got caught and recycled back to the very beginning. Yeah. See, some people say like, you take advantage of people, right? You, that's not right. You take advantage of people. Other people are like, no, you're a true entrepreneur, right? I, maybe it was both. I, I don't know. I'd, I saw an opportunity and obviously there was a market for it. Again, that was another situation where everybody had access to cash, but nothing to spend it on. Cause you know, once a week you could actually go to the ATM and pull out 300 bucks. And so it, it was just an opportunity. And I'm glad I never got caught. It was a risky thing to do. You know, it, it very well could have got me booted. <laughs> you yeah, know? luckily you never left your lock on. Yeah, exactly. Yeah, exactly. And I, I was just, I was very careful and I stuck to a strategy. I said, I'm, I'm not going to get greedy. I'm not going to do this whole bunch. I'm going to do this once a week. And I told everybody that. And other the, the people that got caught did get greedy. They're like, oh, I, I see the market here. I'm going to take advantage. Um, and they got busted and then kicked back. And that is a horrible, I mean, to make it four or five weeks into basic training and get kicked back to the beginning. Ooh. Well, luckily they didn't drop a dime on you. Yeah, exactly. Exactly. You know, I, de I, I definitely got lucky. It was a big risk. Um, but that was really like, I left basic training inspired. Uh, and then I got up to Alaska and I'm like, all right, well, what now? You know, I'm just, you know, I'm getting up here to the unit. What do I do? Uh, well, I was a tech nerd. So I put a big six foot omnidirectional antenna in my barracks room and, uh, or just outside of it. And there were five barracks buildings held about a hundred people a piece. And when I got there, um, I set it up like the airport, you open up your laptop or your phone and it connects. And then it automatically brings you to a page that says, how much internet do you want to buy? Uh, and up in Alaska, you had to buy the whole package. You had to buy the home phone, you had to buy the, the cable and you had to buy the internet, but most people just wanted the internet. That's all they wanted. And so, uh, I put it out there and I'm just like, Hey, I'm going to let you buy internet by the day, by the week, by the month or six months if you want the really good deal. And I had, you know, I had about 50 people, 60 people before I left for Iraq that were on a subscription basis for internet. They nice. weren't, they weren't going through them as, you know, I bought the big package and made a lot of money there. And then I'm on the plane to Iraq, 24 hour flight. And of course we're going there to do a mission, right? So I'm not really thinking about all these things, but I'm like, man, I just shut everything down. Cause when Fort Wainwright deploys, everybody deploys. So the internet, you know, there was no reason to have it there. Uh, so I'm on this, plane ride. And I'm like, I couldn't come up with anything. I'm, I'm racking my brain and just thinking about what, what could I do to kind of, you know, what other entrepreneurial project could I launch here? And it wasn't until about three or four weeks after I got in country, you know, they have all these hottie shops that sell pirated DVDs and, you know, shit off brand, you know, cameras and iPods and stuff like that. So I started talking to these guys and I'm like, you know, why are you selling the stuff that, that Americans aren't used to? You're three levels down quality wise. Is this all you have access to? And they're like, yeah, this is, this is what we have. This is our market. And I'm like, 
what if you could have better stuff? Because the, you know, obviously the the dinar uh, is garbage compared to the dollar. And that's all Americans had was dollars over there, you know, the soldiers and airmen and all those guys. So I'm like, are you willing to run a test with me? Let me buy you a laptop, a digital camera, an iPod, uh, you know, stuff like that. And I bought it auction. So it was, you know, things that were two or three years ago. Uh, and they're selling them cheap because, you know, newer models had come out. So I buy a couple, I give them to them and I say, Hey, this is the deal. I'm going to sell it to you for this. And, uh, and then you get to keep the rest. And they're like, Oh my God, this is the best deal ever. I came back two days later and they're like, on day one, we sold it all. It's mm-hmm. gone. I'm like, yeah, no shit. <laughs> <laughs> I told you, this is what soldiers are looking for. And so they're like, can you get us more? My male guy hated me, hated me with a passion because I always had, you know, these huge, huge boxes coming out. I left Iraq over $8,500 in cash. So it was just one more opportunity that I wasn't looking for it. It fell into my lap. I saw a market for it because all my guys were like, man, I, I really wish we could get our hands on this. You know, nobody's shipping APOs right now. So what are we going to do? I found someone who would. So I just, I, I put two and two together. And so there were all those projects like that, that really, you know, turned me on to the idea that, Hey, maybe I could do this for real. And, and I loved it. It was, it was putting a 10,000 piece puzzle together without the box. I didn't get to see what the picture was. The message was the picture, but you had to put that shit together and you didn't even get all the pieces. Some of them you had to go find or build, you know, and, and put it together. So I have an interesting cutting grass story for you. Yeah, yeah. So from first to fifth grade, I live in a town called Gonzales, Texas, like a small town in like central Texas. Yeah. And so what I would do, I would get my lawnmower, I would go cut people's yard. What yes. I would do, I would like cut half the yard and knock the door. <laughs> hey, I cut you half your yard for you. Is this much money to finish? That's freaking genius. Like no one tell you cut my grass. Well, you know, here's a price for me to finish. But I did it. <laughs> yeah. So here's a price to finish. And of course, like, you know, kind of, some people say like I didn't ask you to get out of here. You know, right, right. Most right. of the times, like the mother or the father would say, "Come on, now he's like ten right, years old. Right, he right, kind of right, grass. Right. Give, give him the money, right? Yeah. You aren't going to cut it anyway, right? <laughs> so yeah, that's that's, that's my a cut grass story. Model, yeah, I like that. It, I, it's I, I, I did have it right, and like so, yeah. That's super wild. Crazy stories, right? Yeah. So the the rest of my professional entrepreneur journey. So those were like that's what I consider the unofficial. You know, that's just me doing projects. There were no licenses. You know, I didn't have business plans, nothing like that. I got my business degree when I came back out of the army uh, in Spokane. And I'm like, all right, I'm going to do this for real. So I, I went to a two-year tech college and got this, uh, this business degree with a marketing specialty. And I put a 55-page business plan together for a smoke shop and a cafe. In 55 pages. 55 pages, man. I, I went all out. Uh, really, really thoughtful and it was well-planned and I had business professors that were looking over it and red penning it for me as well. So really helping me build it. So it's a smoke shop and cafe in Cheney, Washington, population 22,000, right outside Eastern Washington University. And it was like four blocks away. So I'm thinking, you know, cafe, you get coffee, we had a brew pub in the back. Uh, and then you went downstairs. It was a 3000 square foot commercial space right on the main drag. So you walk in, it's the cafe, and then you walk downstairs. It's a smoke shop, e-cigs, hookahs, pipes, you know, stuff like that. Uh, I ultimately raised, I pulled an SBA uh, VA business loan and then raised another 75K and launched this thing. Problem was, there's a population of 22,000. Half of those are the students. So the actual population is only about 10,000. <laughs> so we had this plan. In my plan, it talked about grand opening being on the first day of fall first day of the school year. We needed as much as we could because I knew once summer hit, those kids are gone. And those kids are my clients, right? Those kids are my customers, right? So I, I need those guys. So we needed to bank up as quickly as possible because I have an SBA loan to pay back and it wasn't cheap, <laughs> right? It wasn't cheap money. Um, so we had construction delays, four months, which ate up the vast majority of that first quarter and then some. And so we ran into a lot of problems. We had cash flow issues. I had 18 employees to pay for. Uh, obviously, we were, we were way delayed, so we were over budget. And summer hit. And then cash flow dove into the floor. It's actually what led me to go to the, the oil fields 
to pay for payroll. It was, it was almost an act of, of desperation, right? I didn't, I didn't want to close the doors. This was my first business. Our grand opening, we gave away three kegs worth of beer. We had a live DJ. We had 800 people come through. It was huge. So we were, we were making good sales. We had really great margins on our product. Um, there was, we were the only place in town that was like it. So we had a lot of cool stuff going on. A lot of customers, but also a shit ton of overhead. Way too much. And when I analyzed, you know, obviously I spent a lot of time going back and looking at, man, where were all the places that I messed up? <laughs> you know, and that's a really good thing to do to go back and audit. Um, and there were a lot, I, I never should have gotten into that business in the first place. It, it just wasn't a good idea. And I just didn't know what I didn't know. I'm a brand new entrepreneur. I had no mentor. Um, I wasn't, you know, I wasn't connected to a place like Bunker Labs, uh, you know, score helped where they could, you know, but um yeah i think one thing a lot of entrepreneurs messed up but i've done this mistake a lot is like yeah spending money we don't need to spend like yeah, me, a lot of yeah. time i messed up in the press like i don't really need this platform right now but right it's six months free right and, right right and, you know but then you realize you never use it right you just yeah. throw this money away yep yep so the business ultimately failed i had to shut the doors while i was in north dakota and i owed forty five thousand dollars in taxes because i wasn't paying my taxes because <laughs> i needed to pay payroll <laughs> Right. So there were just a lot of problems. Uh, I ended up having to close the doors. I never filed bankruptcy. I paid everything back, but um, it was rough. I mean, it, this is more than just falling and scraping your knee. Right. I mean, I, I put a lot of, I had investors. You know, I, I put a lot of money on, I put my entire savings. You know, I was, while I was in the military, I saved a lot of money. I traded stocks when I was in Iraq also. Um, so, I mean, I had a, I put a healthy, I put every penny that I had into this. I believed in it. And I was so focused on scale because I had a model that nobody had ever seen before with the cafe and the smoke shop together. And like, we had a lounge where bands would come in and play live music and stuff like that. Nobody had ever seen anything like that before. Do you think the best would have been a success for you? It would have been in a bigger city. Yeah, definitely. That, that was probably one of the core mistakes is I picked a tiny, tiny little podunk town. Why, why do you pick the town where you, you had the college No, just college. the, the, the college like this? So it's not like you had family there or no. background there. Okay. No, it's, it, it was strategically chosen because, um, you know, we were 30 minutes, 25 minutes away from Spokane, which is a pretty big city ish. Definitely not like Seattle, but, um, the college kids made the most sense. That was, that was the target demographic. Mm -hmm. And so, and I, I just, I believed in the model. I, I believed in the business. And I think if I would have chosen a better location, we probably would have had a better time. And probably didn't spend money on stuff you didn't need to, right? Yeah, yeah, totally, totally. So, um, you know, that was, I learned very, very valuable lessons from that experience. When you, you know, there's this whole thesis, this whole theory of you don't know what you don't know. And that's a dangerous place to be because how could you possibly learn what mm -hmm. you don't know, right? Well, in my experience, there's only two ways to do that. It's information and education, which is reading books, talking to people, podcasts, you know, stuff like that or putting your feet in the water and not just one, not a toe, both feet in the water. Yeah, you got to dive in, right? Yeah. You're, you're going in. You can't waddle in. That's you right. Know. No, you, you go, uh, you know, balls to the wall, hundred percent, hundred and ten percent, no question. Right. And so that's the route that I took because I didn't have anything else. And there were no, you know, this was you know, 2012. There weren't, and I didn't, I wasn't aware of business podcasts and, and sponsor incubators and, you know, stuff like that. It, it just wasn't on my radar. And so, you know, before I closed the doors to that business is when I left for North Dakota. So I'm working in the oil fields, working 90 hours a week so I can pay my employees. Um, and ultimately we just ran out of cash and, and I wasn't able to get the North Dakota thing. I mean, when, when I ended the North Dakota thing, we were killing it. I mean, it's just absolutely murdering the scene, uh, but it took me a minute to get up and, you know, up and running. A good thing is good that you're humble enough to take those lessons. A lot of people like, yeah. don't take the lessons. It's yeah, like, right. It's right. not my fault. It's, it's the economy, the market, it's the college yeah. students. It was my fault, yeah. 100%. And like you took those lessons and you're yeah. doing something better now. Yeah. Well, and you know, we, we were talking about Paul Akers earlier. He wrote a book called Two Second Lean. Uh, and there's so much of that that I really relate to about constant, small improvements. He pays his employees 30 minutes a day to look at something that they touch and improve it by two seconds. Mm -hmm. Two seconds means nothing in the moment. But when you daisy chain those two seconds together over a year or five years or 10 years, and then multiply that by 160 employees, holy shit, massive, massive improvements and gains over time. Now it's, now it's exponential, right? And so 
that is one of the the philosophies that I really took early on is I don't want to just come into this and just kind of plow my way through it. I want to learn from every single thing that I possibly can, whether that's other people or experiences or whatever. But I'm looking at every opportunity as a way to how do we improve from this? What can we learn from this? And then have continuity, right? And have have it be so brand new employees that never learned that lesson can still learn that lesson without having to learn it the hard way. So James, how do you bounce back from this? Like I, like I said earlier, like a lot of people don't take the lessons. They yeah. like, oh, will we be? They don't bounce back. You know, they, they go to like a, a lifelong depression, so to speak, and yeah. never recover. How did you recover from this? I think once I lit the, once I lit the entrepreneur spirit, there's no dimming that down. There's, there's no extinguishing that. And so when I, you know, there was a time of it's like, well, shit, you know, now I've got a black mark on my record, right? Any other, any other money that I go and try and raise is going to, you know, people are going to, I'm not going to hide this, you know, um, people need to know that I've, I've tried, I've, I've, I've struck out, you know, and I, I have fallen and crashed. Um, I think that's important for people to know, but I think people look at it the wrong way. You know, you look at, I mean, there's all of these stories about these multi-billionaire entrepreneurs that filed bankruptcy and sometimes not just once. So entrepreneurship isn't about hitting the grand slam on your first swing. There's a process and you may fail. And I think if you're so afraid of failure, you shouldn't be in this game. You have to be open to learning. You have to be open to failure. There's just no question. And so I think there was a period of time where I think my time in North Dakota was good because it forced me to just, I put my head down. You were actually doing something 24 seven. Yeah, right. right. I'm just, you, I mean, you had no time to be feel sorry for yourself. Mm-hmm, mm-hmm. And, and at that point, I mean, I wasn't even, you know, we were killing it, but I wasn't making money for me. It's not like my pockets were fat. I had to repay all these taxes and, you know, I had, I had debts to repay and big ones, you know, six figure debts. So I'm out there just trying to get back to zero. No, it's you know, a lot of people too in this situation are like, I'm not working on, I'm not working on order, Phil. That's beneath yeah, right, me, right? You right, know, right, right, like, right. Like, you like nothing beneath me right now. I got to right. make it happen. Well, and, and I saw it as a way to make money fast. Mm-hmm. And it was, holy shit, was it? <laughs> you know, not as fast as I would have liked. But, you know, by the time that I moved back to Tacoma um, to get into real estate, you know, I had 40 or 50K in the bank. And that was enough for me. You know, that, that was enough for me to go, okay, I've got float. So I can, I can move there and not have to go get a job right away, which I didn't. I got my real estate license and, and started hustling again, built another business plan. This time it was only 40 pages, but, <laughs> you know, but still, so, you know, I, I knew real estate. I was always interested in real estate. You know, you read rich dad, poor dad and, and stuff like that, which was very correlated with the millionaire next door during that time. And so, you know, I always had investments, you know, in 2011, I bought my first house and house hacked it and, you know, just sold that in 2020. You know, but um, I was always interested in flipping houses too, wholesaling, you know, stuff like that. So I, I got into the investor game while I was getting into the professional game. Uh, and that went really well. But, you know, falling down, you really only have two options. Either you're going to stay there and let it consume you or you're going to get out of it. You know, this is the, the mouse and the butter type of a, you know, type of deal. Uh, and I just was not willing to stop. I had ambitions to build something big, uh, bigger than me. None of this has ever been because I just want money. Yeah. Yeah. I mean, what is it? it, it entrepreneur says, I want to do this because I want to get rich. They always feel right. It's a bad, that's a bad motivation. Well, people are like, I, 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 I'll, I'll build any idea, whatever the case may be. You got to have right. a passport because this is right. We're talking about this. It sucks. It, it sucks, right? The, the irony is if you do it the right way, there's more money involved. Oh yeah. Without a doubt. Yeah. If, if you're not focused, you know, I, I think about money like a carrot on a stick for most people. So they're chasing it. And that means they're ignoring everything else. And that's just not a good way to do it. I've seen so many people fail. I mean, the SBA says that too. It's, you know, 80% of businesses fail in the first three to five years, something like that. So you're already up against the mountain, you know, and, and that's, I, I really view that's a good way to see it. You're at the base of the mountain and you're going to climb this thing. And it's huge. You don't realize, so you might have everything, the right team, right? Everything Mm -hmm. you Mm -hmm. might still feel right. Like this stuff happens. People, people who train for decades to climb Everest still die. Yeah. They still die. They, they, they end it. It's done. They're out. And so, you know, you need to do everything that you can offset that. I think my biggest mistake was 
you know, the military, I don't agree with everything the military does or their philosophies, but one of the ones that really did stick with me is the, and it's always cheesy to say, but the 90% preparation, 10% execution. And I drive that into everybody around me because I just believe in it so wholeheartedly. And I see so many people come up with this great idea. They'll do 10% preparation be like, let's go. We're rolling. That's, you know, my, my analogy about the 10,000 piece puzzle, that's putting together, you know, 50% of your edge and then saying, okay, I know what the picture is. Let's go. And it just doesn't work like that. You need to take the time. Nothing in entrepreneurship happens fast. And that is my biggest frustration in entrepreneurship because I have a good idea. I have a good plan. I know what needs to happen and it still takes time. So my challenge is I'm not a patient person, right? <laughs> right. I don't think I, I'm not patient. Many people all. aren't. <laughs> but to be an entrepreneur, you gotta you gotta have patience, right? How how have you been able to like like have more patience in your entrepreneurial journey? The honest truth is I don't think I've I'm not a patient person either. Again, my military spirit comes out and it's all right, we've got a plan. It's well prepped. We're trained. Let's go do this thing. You know? Um, I've had other people around me. My my executive coach really lit me up to this in the beginning where you know, he picked me up at, at one level and like six months later, I'm complaining to him, like, man, why is this going so slow? This should be going faster. And he said something to me. He looks at me and he goes, James, turn around. Look at where we've come in six months. Like, let's objectively look at how far you've come in six months. And he was right. I turned around and looked. I'm like, damn, that actually, actually is a, a pretty good chunk, thing. I forget, right? I forget to do that a lot of times too. Context, like stepping back and looking at the bigger picture, because when you're an entrepreneur, you're so close to what you're building. You're so close to what you're doing. And I think it's very hard for entrepreneurs to step back and be like, all right, let's look at the bigger picture now. Let's look at the context of what we're doing. And my director of operations is, he has to tune me up on this quite a bit as well. You know, I'm, I'm always like, man, we should be able to do this faster. Just, no, 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 no. Look at it. Look at it like this. Um, so it, I think it's taken other people around me that can, that are naturally looking at the bigger picture. I, I think you need a balance. Either you need to be good. You know, Ray Dalio talks about this too. A, a shaper is somebody who can look at the long-term implications and the short-term at the same time. And that's hard. It's way harder than it sounds. And so you either need to be able to do that or have somebody around you that can offset what you can't. So for me, I like to be close in the details. And I, I'm a big vision thinker too. You know, I mean, we're raising, we're raising a lot of money right now to do something big, to change a societal trend and, and a crisis and a problem. Um, and so I am a big thinker too, but I, I do tend to get stuck in the weeds. Um, and it, it's just hard for me to think on that bigger picture at the same time. So I just put people in place that can help kind of offset that balance. And I think that's a good lesson in entrepreneurship in general. I'm not good at everything. I'm not. So having people in place to be able to offset my weaknesses as a business owner and an entrepreneur, it's hard because that's an ego thing. Um, and that's probably a whole nother, like I could do a whole nother podcast on ego um, and how having an ego as an entrepreneur is going to drive you into the ground. So James, as an entrepreneur, we're telling us to over and over again, right? You're telling yeah. people the business stuff. But most of the time, people don't get the vision right. Right. How do you deal with people not getting your vision right? Do you get frustrated? Like, oh, they're not smart enough. They won't get like, how do you deal with people not getting the vision you have for your company? I think the, the preface of, of the answer is you need to hire the right people. You, you need to have the right people around you. Uh, and that starts with having people who have the ability to see the vision. I think that's really important. Um, but when I've got people who I believe can see the vision that don't, I want to bring them in and ask them, what vision they see, right? If we have a, I, I'm really big on explicit stuff. There's implicit and explicit. So if I have an expectation of you, but I don't tell you that's implicit. I think you know that this should be done. So I wanna make things more black and white, really boil it down so we can be talking about the same thing. I always use, use this analogy. I want you to think about, I, I, I'm gonna give you a word. I want you to picture it in your mind, Apple, right? Now the question is, it's a word that we both understand, right? This kindergarten level stuff, right? My question is, what did you picture? Did you picture a red apple or a green apple? Was it in the store or on your dining room table? Was it whole or was it cut? Or maybe it wasn't an apple at all. Maybe it was a laptop. 
Yeah, I thought of a, I, in my picture. I had a red apple right. and the apple logo. Yeah, 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 yeah. I had those two things in my mind. You said apple, right. red apple and the apple logo. The point of this is words mean things. And we could be operating under this conception that we both understand what the word apple means. But when I say apple, I meant something different mm-hmm. than you. Right. So I think really boiling it down and making sure that everybody's operating under the same definitions of things. That's a good foundation. It's a good basis. Um, and then I think all entrepreneurs need empathy. Yeah. That's and, a big and, one. And, and understand, you know, the best entrepreneurs that I've seen are very strong in all emotional intelligence, not just, not just empathy. Um, but having empathy matters here because not everybody's going to see, you know, everybody has their own context of the situation. Mm-hmm. Right there, you might be standing right next to somebody, but they see it a different way. And I want to understand that as much as I can. Again, back to the idea of meritocracy, um, you know, structure of an organization. And that could be a nonprofit, that could be a for profit, it could be anything. It works for everything. And it is, in my opinion, the best infrastructural way to run any organization. And so I spend a lot of time understanding where they're coming from, how they see it, comparing it to what I see. And making sure that even if we don't agree, that they can get behind it. Because at the end of the day, a decision needs to be made. We can't linger in this, well, we have different opinions. Either you get on board or you don't. And at the end of the day, that's what it is. And when people are getting on board, it's not always my idea. Sometimes I have to relent and say, you know what? Your idea is better. Yeah. We're, we're going with that. Could be the guy that just got hired a week ago. <laughs> it's possible. Yeah. He, he sees he sees some, some outside perspectives. I, I also think about this a lot. This, this is really relevant to this question. You ever seen a 3D movie? Yeah. Okay. Yeah. So you go into the 3D movie, you get your glasses, you sit down. You ever take the 3D glasses off? All the time. Just to see? All the time. Right? It's an yeah. interesting thing because yeah. you can still make out what's going on, but something's wrong. Yeah. Right? Something's off. And it doesn't work as well. It takes a special lens. And I think everybody has their own set of 3D glasses that allows you to see something that's there but not everybody can see it without that particular lens. And that's kind of how I view this whole conversation is I want to, I need to put on your glasses to see what's going on, to see what I can't see. And now I can see something that is right in front of me, but it's a different context, right? So I'm, I'm constantly striving to put on other people's glasses Mm -hmm. and that have special lenses that see things that I can't, you have a different background. You came up differently. You had a, you know, you grew up in a different environment. You had different experiences. Um, different cultural norms, all those things play into how you see things today, right? That's yeah. your lens. Yeah, that, that's, exactly. your, that's your 3D glasses. And so I'm really bullish on understanding where everybody's coming from as much as I can, um, because I think it all matters. You might be able to see something that I can't, and it's the right answer. Mm-hmm. I want to know that. Yeah, I think communication is a big challenge too. Like a lot of people, like they'll tell someone one thing, that person hears something else, yeah, yeah. and they go tell somebody, so-and-so said I could do this. Right. Well, no, I didn't. I said this. Right. No, this is exactly what you said. Well, I meant, I heard, you know, yeah, it's yeah. like, oh, what's that game where there's 10 people and one person whispers in the ear? Telephone. But, yeah. By the 10 yeah, person, yeah, yeah. it's like completely not even anywhere close, yeah. you know? There's no doubt communication is a big one. I think the other factor of that, that's a miscommunication. I think the lack of communication is a big one too. In the corporate world and in the military, especially, we're not encouraged to have this sandbox environment. We're encouraged to follow orders and shut the hell up, right? So I think it's also about changing or modifying people's understanding of what communication needs to be. How do you communicate and articulate your authentic self and and what you see and what you think? I think a lot of people are so afraid of the consequences of being honest about what they think. And that's why I like the sandbox. We built an environment that makes it okay to be wrong, it makes it okay to bring your ideas to the table for consideration. And we've built a template and a structure around, you know, hey, if you're gonna bring an idea to the table, here, here's the template that we need to objectively look at this and understand where it fits into the picture, you know? Um, but building an environment where people are open, where it's encouraged for people to bring ideas and thoughts to the table, I think that's a that's a game changer because that doesn't exist in very many businesses that I've seen. It doesn't. The military is about about it too. Like I, 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 so many times where somewhere I rank, we had no experience in HR. God, we're doing like this. Like okay, yeah. like I remember when I was a captain, you know, and this lieutenant colonel told me he had no HR experience. Any yeah, yeah. Told me what to do. I said, so you should do it like this. No, right. we're doing it like this. Of course, 
Right. The full board colonel yeah. general blasted his ass. Yeah, that's right. And said, did you ask Jason what to do? Right. Right. Uh, right. Uh, from now on, listen to Jason. And that's, you know, that's an authoritarian mindset. And that, again, going back to the idea of meritocracy being the best, a dictatorship or authoritarian uh, leadership model often doesn't work. It, it has a lot more cons than it does pros. And I think a lot of it has to do with control. And if you're going to run a successful business and be an entrepreneur, you have to release control. You have to trust other people. Yeah. I, I know the military, like, like, but most people in the military are collaborative. People ask me, they think, no, the military authority. So there are some, but for the most part, this is my experience. All the good leaders ask the people how to do stuff, right? Yeah. Collaborative, yeah. you know, yep. they're like, you might do exactly what you want, but give me your viewpoints, right. right? Yeah. All the ones who like got bad report cards or whatever, or yeah. like, they like do it my way or no way, you know? That's right. And I had so many leaders in the beginning that were like that. I consider them bottom of the barrel leaders. They didn't understand leadership. They understood power. Mm -hmm. And you're certainly not getting my attention with that kind of model. So the funny, this not, it wasn't funny. It's funny now it was from the time. I had this one job with a person in charge. He would make a sign out on the board, right? Mm -hmm. Even to go to the bathroom, there's like right across the hallway, right? And of course, you all sit down on him, right? He got relieved like in six months. Absolutely. We like, we, we did, we did the bare minimum. Yeah. And the next person that came in, we're like, we just went all out. We don't know anything about you, but we, we're going to make you look good and make the other guy yeah, look good. Yeah, that's right. Worse. That's right. I think, I think it's hard to teach leadership because you, you need to have some underlying traits that make a good leader. Like you need some kind you of know? empathy and emotional intelligence, you know, back to emotional intelligence. I think, I really do think that's the foundation of leadership. Yeah. I think any organization is good people, bad people, good leaders, bad leaders, you 100%. know? Yeah. I, I haven't been the greatest leader over time. I've, I've had to learn a lot of lessons. Leadership and entrepreneurship is a journey. I think that's what needs to be understood. It's, there is no finish line. You're always learning. You're always growing. Um, but you're not born with the concepts of emotional intelligence. You're not born with the concepts of leadership. That means you need to learn it. And so, you know, a lot of people learn it growing up. They get it at a really young age. Other people learn it when they get exposed to certain people, certain environments. And some people are different have an elitist attitude, right? I remember I was mm -hmm. a lieutenant. I was going to dinner with the, the, the person I know, a lieutenant, right? Yeah. And so we just this place we were in Germany. He would go to eat, rest, eat dinner at this German restaurant in Germany. I think it was a German restaurant. Mm -hmm. and he went in there. He sent his soldiers. He said, we got to leave. Like, why? My soldiers aren't here. Like, are you kidding me, right? You can't eat dinner in the same place. I'm, right. not, I'm not saying go to have tequila shots with them, but like, the, they're thing. there with their family having dinner. Like, I'm like, are you kidding me right now? Right. And, you know, and, and, and everything, every metric that we got measured on in the company, his platoon was always last, right? Yeah. Yeah. Cause this guy, like, he would do stupid stuff. So like, you know, at one time, now this is ridiculous. They would do PT. He was like, he, he, he will pass in his, on his bicycle. He counts the platoon on the day because the platoon sergeant didn't call the, the platoon to attention while he rode by the bicycle. <laughs> and he's telling me, like, I love those stories. Like, those like, are so like, great. Are you kidding me right now? Yeah. Like, you expect him? Uh, like, yeah. Because I was, was prior to this, you know, he's yeah, a friend yeah. I, I try to yeah. tell him, but he just, he just, like, who are you, guy? <laughs> yeah, he just wouldn't get it, right? And, and that's the funny thing about the military is people think their rank makes them a leader. Yeah. And <laughs> just could not be further from the truth. Only thing that works that is my experience is when the military spouse thinks the rank belongs to them. Oh, don't get me started on that. <laughs> <laughs> it's horrible. It's horrible. And it's, it's frustrating. And I've, I've met those, those Karens. They, they definitely exist. Uh, and they're horrible. Yeah. You know, you will address me by my husband's rank. You can get the fuck out of here. I know. <laughs> like, no, no, just so much. No. Um, but like some people get it. Some people don't. Yeah, that's right. That's right. And, and that is the problem. And, and that's ultimately, you know, there were a lot of reasons that I left the military. Um, but that was one of them is I got so sick and tired of seeing great ideas and having great ideas about how we could be more efficient how we could train better, how we could do things better that were easy, implementable things mm -hmm. that didn't, that we're not changing the entire infrastructure. We don't need new software. You know, these were simple things. And because they were coming from lower enlisted, you know, they're, they're not the Lieutenant. They're not the first Sergeant. They're not yeah. the commander. They're not the brigade commander. No, you don't get to have ideas yeah. was the notion that I got. And obviously, you know, I knew other, you know, I have brothers that were in different units that are like, Oh, my leadership is the best. Listen to this. And I'm like, damn, that is, that is pretty good, yeah. actually. Um, and not to say that I had all bad leadership. I didn't. There were some really, really great people um, up and down the chain of command. But I touched a lot of people, you know, and, and were under a lot of people that just were 
Yeah, and the challenge was Horrible. like, like there, it seemed like there's some good leaders that got promoted below zone ahead mm -hmm. of time, mm -hmm. but it just seemed like most of the people got advanced were like the horrible people, right? Yeah, that's right. Like, because right. like they, you know, in the Illuvarsi Valley System Army is like it's short term, right? Six yeah. months, you know, yeah. they don't think long term. Like, yep. you increase by by six percent or whatever by right. a certain period, right? But learn you, you burn the crap out of your people, right? Mm -hmm. And so they leave, get promoted, and another person comes in. I got to make them right. people's backs, right. right? And this kills everyone. It's a hard thing to navigate, and I just saw an opportunity to do better from the outside. You know, and so I got out and turned around and said, all right, how can I help my brothers? And that's ultimately what really got me into real estate because it's, it's a crisis. It and the Army's changed so much too. Like, like right now, I would never advise anyone to retire from the military, right? The Seriously. Because they're really taking the retirement plan and stuff like yeah. that. Like I said, do your four, six years, you know. Yeah, yeah. Now, I would say like if, if you like a top performance review right, right. and people are telling you like who we know what the thing is, like based on your performance, so you have a chance like make colonel or right, sergeant major. Right. Then maybe stay in, but you're just an average person. Yeah. You're four, six years, get your skills, yeah. GI Bill, and get yeah. out of there, right? Because yeah. this is to me. You're, you're right about the evolution. You know, I, I had a lot of family that was in the military during the Vietnam era and, and after. And I always enjoyed hearing stories about, hey, what was daily life like in your world? And then I went through my experience and obviously complete, you know, it's a whole different army, not even remotely the same thing. And then I talked to people who are getting in now. And they're telling me their stories. I'm like, it's a whole different army. Mm -hmm. I got out in 2012. It's a whole different army in 2020, 2021, yeah. 2022. You know, I mean, this it's not even the same thing. No. So I I don't know what to do with that. <laughs> so here's a funny story for you. So I went to basic training for Knox and AIT for AG and Jonas, eight Army's HR yep. at Fort Benjamin Harrison, right? And so I'm going the first, I think the first week of school, second week of school, for some reason, like we had to type in social security numbers to the form, right? And for some reason, and I was just like having brain lock or just dumb, a dumb fuck back then. Like, you know, you do social security number like one, two, three, yeah, slash. Yeah. I can figure out if you have a slash or no slash, right? <laughs> so I failed two tests. I got recycle, right? Jeez. But, you know, I got recycled the class two weeks before me. They didn't move my room. Mm. I stayed in the same room. Yeah. And so what I did, no one knew this. Some people did. So my first class passed all the things like you get freedom to go back. Yeah, no, right, no curfew. right, right. I did it with them. Ah. <laughs> so like, <laughs> Fell into that weird little pocket. Exactly right. So I'm, I'm, I'm like, I'm on their like their schedule, right? Yeah, Even though yeah. I'm going to class the other one, right? Yep, yep. Yeah, take advantage of the situation. Look, when you're in basic training in AIT, you don't say no to opportunities that, no. that fall into your lap. You, you got to get it where you can. <laughs> exactly. Yeah. Um, so next, let's talk about your fundraising. Mm. So you're raising a hundred million dollars. Yep. I'm like, are you kidding me? Like, what the fuck are you trying to do? Like, right, most right. people can't raise $200,000, right? right? Right. So you got to walk me through this. So let me give you context. At scale, I'm actually raising $7.5 billion, okay. which is a stupid, 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 absurd number. I'll explain the scale in a minute. But the money is being used by real estate mm. homes in cash. So we need a lot, right? Houses ain't cheap anywhere in the US. The idea is, we've got this situation. And I live this in my own personal military experience, but it's becoming accelerated. The problem is accelerated by a lot of things. But the real problem is housing is not available and it's not affordable. The military doesn't pay that well, right? Nice to have BAH, right? Nice to have all those other things that the military, you know, the perks. But and the challenge too is like they reimburse you some, but they yeah. reimburse you after the fact. Yeah, right. And right, you got to right. go through those fucking mm -hmm. challenges and paperwork. The and whole thing's a mess. The, just the whole thing is a mess. And so, what are the results of that? The results of the mess in PCSing to a new duty station and trying to find housing is typically you're stuck in a hotel for long periods of time. Here at JBLM, we've got guys that have been in hotels for six, eight, 12 months. And it's not the best hotel. And like you're in the NBC suites, you're like, you know, no. Hotel Six or Red yeah. Roof Inn or, yeah. you know, crap like that. And not just that but you've got your spouse, you've got your kids, you've got your animals and whatever you could fit in your car. And you're like in a, in your hotel, you're like, you know, in like it's a, a, it's a, a studio. It's like, you know, a hotel room. You're like, you're probably like two beds, yeah. you and your wife, your kid, yeah. and your dog, right? Your cot maybe. Yeah. Yeah. It's tiny. This is not vacation, right? Hotels are supposed to be for vacation. <laughs> Living in a hotel is a miserable, miserable experience. And there are side effects to that. You don't have a permanent address. You're not registering your kids for school. Your household goods are locked up in a storage facility somewhere. You can't access those. Your spouse struggles to find employment because your kids can't get registered for school. 
there's a lot of ancillary things that creates relationship problems and stresses all over the place. Not to mention the financial stress because the military ain't paying that hotel rate for seven months, eight months. You know, you only get a certain amount of time. Same thing for your household goods. So this is a problem. So after five years of being in real estate and helping people PCS to the point where I have their key in hand before they even get here, I got the team together and said, we need to do something bigger right? Not everybody wants to buy when they get to a new duty station anyway. They don't know the area. They don't know what schools are good. They don't know where their spouse is going to work yet. And plus, you don't know how long you'll be there either, right? Yeah, that's right. You might be, be there for two years or yeah. four years. Buying is not right for everybody. I'm a real estate agent telling you buying might not be right for you, right? Most agents are going to be like, nah, just buy. So the core idea of where this idea came from is we wanted to show active duty service members and veterans how they could use real estate as a tool to build financial independence. This is not just about putting a roof over your head. This is about exiting the military with a large nest egg of equity and cash flow. So you don't have to turn around right away, maybe, and go do a job you don't want to do just because you have to put food on the table, right? If you've got money coming in from other places, you might have VA disability, you might have retirement, and now you got passive income coming in from real estate. So we built this military exclusive rent to own program where you don't want to buy. Cool. You want to rent? Cool. You want to buy? Cool. I don't care. I'm agnostic on what you want to do. I'm here to, I'm here to bring solutions to the table. So what we do on our website, we basically take the homes that are for sale right now on the market. We approve you for a cap, right? Maybe 2,500 bucks a month. And we let you go shop. We have the keys to all these houses. So we go out with another brother because we're 100% veteran owned and operated. There is nobody that isn't military affiliated on my staff. That means everybody has experienced what you're experiencing right now in real, in their real life, right? They know what it's like because they lived in the hotels. They've struggled with this. So we go shop. You find the house that you want. And I've got a nine figure bank account in the background. And I'm going to go buy that house for you to rent but I'm going to give you an option to purchase at the cost that I bought the house for. So if you want to build an equity portfolio and you want, cause you could be doing this at every single duty station. Right. And I think you should be, it's not right for everybody, but that's a whole nother, that's a whole nother podcast. So if you're selling the house at the same cost, you bought it, how are you making your money? How are you monetizing this? Yeah. So normally when you have an option to purchase, you're paying a big upfront fee, right? You're paying, you know, five, 10% upfront just to have the option. Uh, we built this just for the military. And so there is no upfront option. We're rolling an option fee. It's 3% into the VA loan. So you're not paying anything out of pocket, right? There are no fees to get into this program that aren't regular rental. You're going to pay a security deposit like you would anywhere else and first month's rent, but that's it. That's all you need to get into these homes. How does like the credit report, that kind of stuff work? How does that work for you? I think we're, so we have some strategic relationships where we're able to boost credit scores. Like we can force a, a service member's credit mm -hmm. score up by about 60 to 85 points mm -hmm. within that's, a year. That's a lot of people, that's all they need, right? That's all they need, right? And the VA doesn't have a minimum credit score mm -hmm. to buy a house, uh, but banks do. Yeah. So there's, there's overlays. Um, so this whole idea was flexibility. You come to a new base. First of all, hopefully you got in touch with me before you got there, mm -hmm. right? So we can have the key ready. So there is no hotel. That just eliminates so much headache out the gate. So you move into this rental and you're renting but now all of a sudden you're getting these perks to become an owner at which you're going to save a lot of money because rent is always going to be more expensive than ownership. Right. Isn't that kind of ironic? It's always like, so I can't get a loan for a house payment for $1,500. Yeah. Right. But yeah. I have to pay rent for $2,000. Yeah, that's right. It, it's so ironic. Um, and look, there's a right and a wrong time to rent. You know, there, there's a time and a place for it for sure. And again, I want to give flexibility. I don't care if you buy the house. I don't because I'm just going to put another military family in there. I have a pipeline, right? We have, you know, just JBLM alone, we're having 250 families a month coming into the base. How do people find out about your program? You got a social media campaign, marketing, mm -hmm. like you advertise in the military yeah. related article magazines, or how do you get the word out? So we have a, an exclusive partnership with hrn.com. Mm -hmm. they're, they're a pretty big player in the housing game. Um, we're in talks right now with JBLM leadership to be on post and, and doing the newcomers briefs and the transition. Oh, that'd briefs be big and, and for you. That's huge. That's huge. Um, you know, all the way up to the white house, the white house just released a paper that acknowledges 
housing being a significant issue for the military. So all the way up to the White House, they're talking about yeah. this, right? So the government is looking for answers. They need, they need solutions. And the military is not in the business of real estate. They never have been, right? Yeah. There's only like 15 or 20% of the population of JBLM that can live on base just because of the population of homes that they have. Yeah. They don't have a lot of homes. So that they rely on the outside. You know, you got to buy a rent off post. And so that's kind of where this program came from. Is, and how ironic is this? A little bit of subject. Yeah. So the people who can afford to live off base, like the generals, colonels, so they mm -hmm. live on base. And mm -hmm. the people who yeah. can't afford the E4s, yeah. E5s, they can live off base. Yeah. Yeah. Those are the guys that want to be five minutes away from work. Yeah. Those are the guys that they don't mind leaving work and driving a couple of doors down and being yeah. home. Yeah. I, I couldn't do it. <laughs> no, thanks. So we came up with this idea in August of 2020. We launched our first hedge fund. It's a 506C. We're registered with the SEC. This is the real deal, right? We have lawyers, a whole nine yards, right? So we launched this big presentation and we're going after accredited investors. As high net worth individuals, you gotta have a million dollars in net worth, not including your personal residence or as a single person, quarter million dollars a year in income for two years, 300K as a married couple. Um, and single family offices and, you know, there, there's all kinds of different categories of investors that would work for this. And pretty early, about a month in, uh, we're getting great feedback on the idea. Uh, we've got a, you know, a decent line out the door of people who want to, you know, do fifty thousand dollar investments and stuff like that, which was our minimum. And we realized if we were going to do fifty thousand dollar investments, we needed like four hundred and fifty investors to hit twenty million, which was our go number, right? We're we're building a runway so we don't open the program and then immediately have to turn it off because there's so much demand that we run out of cash too fast, right? That's that's the real, that's what keeps me up at night, because there's a lot of people out there that need this. And so I don't want to start it and stop it and start it and stop it. That's bad. That's bad marketing, right? So we need a runway. So 20 million is our go number. We had this opportunity drop into our lap from a, a big bank, one of the top five that came to us and said, hey, this is interesting. What are you doing with this? And so we talked to him and we started escalating up the chain. We hit a supervisor. And then, and then we kept going up and this changed. Hey, Jay, quickly. Yeah. Can you talk about how the opportunity came for the bank to come to you? Come, come to the bank just didn't call you out of the blue. No, right? no, they don't. Can you talk about some of how that opportunity came, how like mm -hmm. your networking came mm -hmm. and all that yep. came together real fast? It actually was my director of ops. Um, he had somebody in his personal network that he served with in the Air Force that was connected to this organization in the mortgage department. And he approached him and said, hey, you know, I, I see your social media posts. I see what you're doing here, but what is it really? Like, like break it down for me. And so we started to realize in that moment, it was, it was this guy coming to us and saying, hey, this is really interesting that we may have been going after the wrong people because accredited investors who want to write a $50,000 check are a dime a dozen. They're out there. But we needed bigger numbers. 20 million is a lot. 100 million is a lot. Forget the 7.5 billion. Like we're still in the zero to one mode. So, you know, that's not even relevant right now. But to a bank or a mortgage lender, what's $5 million? These guys have hundreds of millions. USAA is worth two, 215 billion or something like that. 5 million bucks. I don't even think they can write checks that small, you know? And so, but the real, the real game changer for us was stopping thinking about it like an investment and starting to think about it like a partnership because banks and mortgage lenders have a direct financial benefit from being involved in the transaction. And so if a service member comes into one of our rentals and decides to exercise their option of purchase, there has to be a lender in there. And if I'm connected with strategic partners that are dedicated and doing hundreds of millions, if not billions of dollars a year in VA home loans and have a good system, and by the way, their loan officers are also veterans, which is very important to me. That's a non-negotiable. Now, all of a sudden, we built this pipeline that benefits. I'm basically giving the bank and the mortgage lender free value. I'm just pointing, I'm pointing leads in, in their direction. That's what they want. They, they want the leads. But now they can double dip because they're getting the investment returns from the hedge fund and also the VA loans. James, are you already uh, only on JBLM or different places right now? Right now, we're only JBLM and Bangor Navy Base. That's, that's where I've been for the last five years. But once this goes live, once we actually launch the, the initial round, 
and start putting people in homes, 25 bases per year over three years. So what's your expansion plan? Like you already have like those 25 bases picked out per year. Yeah. Are you going to do all the same time? You're going to like focus on Texas first and North Carolina or what was your plan for that? Yeah, it's, they're definitely scattered. So it's not going to be like, you know, when you look at the map, there's 440 military installations in the U.S. Uh, people still don't realize where the military is, right? right? Yeah, like, right. They don't realize right. that we're in, like, what's it called? Dabuti, mm -hmm, Africa. Mm -hmm, mm -hmm. Like, they're people everywhere. don't realize <laughs> all the places we're at in the world. They're, they're everywhere. But if we just looked at the U.S., which is where we're going to keep our focus for now, I'm not saying we won't go international. Like, uh, you can buy homes in Italy and Germany, maybe Korea. I, I don't know exactly. But um, the U.S. is the focus. We've got, we basically did a, pretty hefty due diligence and narrowed that list of 440 down to 75 said, these are the most strategic bases for us to be at places like Fort Bragg, obviously biggest base in the U S Texas has all kinds of different bases. Like I'm very interested in Texas, very interested in Colorado, very interested in Vegas, you know, with the two air force bases, there. very interested in Arizona. Um, so there's so many bases all over the place that make a lot of sense, um, that are very strategic for us to be at. There's a high demand, um, places like Bragg and JBLM are passing families back and forth all the time because it's the same type of unit, right? So when you're PCSing, a lot of times you're PCSing to a place that has a similar base. Especially like special forces and like that 100%. Yeah, 100%. So, so we, we narrowed down this list of 75. How we're going to expand is getting JBLM and Banger off the ground and, and secure and then taking the template that we build because we're very, like as an entrepreneur, I'm firmly... I'm firmly weighted towards vertically integrated business. If I don't have to hire a, uh, you know, a vendor, then I don't want to. So we've got the real estate company. I also own a property management company and we've got the hedge fund right now. That's the vertical integration. And there's plans later on down the road for each location is going to have a facility 10 to 15,000 square feet. That's going to be backed by 500 storage units, 25 local moving trucks, a, a retail center that has like the bubble wrap and you know blankets and stuff like that. Uh, but then also the real estate offices, which is going to come with a home inspection company and a lender and these other veteran partners. So based like an A to Z operation, mm -hmm. we want to be everything under one roof. We're my goal is to be the household name in military housing. And our, our BHAG, our really audacious goal is a, putting a million military families into homes over the next 10 years. So is this only for military, military people? Or can the military veterans use it? Yeah, too? veterans can use it too. Okay. But no, yeah, I'm not saying some kind, I won't, of, some, some kind of military connection. Yeah, mi yeah, military affiliation. So I'm not saying I won't help a civilian buy a home. Mm -hmm. Of course I will. But the rent to own program is specifically for active duty and veterans. That's it. How about this situation? Like suppose, um, we we'll say um, Billy Bob served in the military from 1989 to 1985. Sure. 1992 that a kid can that kid use a service um that's a good question i'd have to cross that bridge when i get there right now it's just for because here's the thing when i think about who i hire uh they have to be military affiliated so how i define that is you got to be a veteran or a direct dependent of a veteran okay so that's a spouse or a working age kid right so yeah i i think a kid of of a veteran would probably would probably pass that test for me. Yeah. Can you talk some or give advice on like how what your approach to fundraising is? Yeah. Like how do you know about you're doing about that? Like it, how do you qualify your investors? Right. You know, all that kind of process. Yep. Yeah. Cause obviously, you know, again, whether it's 20 million or hundred million, we're talking about a lot of money. Right. And I think being aligned on values is really important to me. So we're talking to organizations that have corporate responsibility that, you know, divisions and they have values that are aligned with us in helping the military community. And that's, that's very important to me because if you don't, if you don't have a passion for helping this niche and this community that serves this country, then we're on a different wavelength. I don't care. And Steve and I talk about this all the time. I don't care if you have a hundred million and you're ready to write the check right now. I'll tell you, no, if we're not aligned, it's not a fit. So I'm, I'm very, very particular about the impact. Because that's going to be a 10, at least a 10-year relationship. We're getting married, right? We're getting married. I, the ironic part is we're getting married to a lot of people. So <laughs> we're definitely not monogamous. But um, <laughs> so it, I, I think that's the most important part for me right now. So the way that we narrowed it down is we looked at, in the first place, who could write the check? 
who could write a $5 million check? Because we started with a $50,000 minimum. Now we're at 5 million. Mm -hmm. So we've, we've kind of changed who we're going after and why. Uh, but from there, it's about their process. And this is just for me, right? I'm looking at if I'm going to bring somebody else. So I have a brother, a military brother that comes to me and says, James, I want to buy a house, or maybe they're ready to use their option to purchase. They have to know beyond a shadow of a doubt that I'm connecting with them with somebody who A, is military affiliated, and B, knows their shit and has a good process to get you from A to B. I, I have to trust that if I hand off a client to you or to any of my vendors, that they're going to hold the bar at the same level that I hold the bar. It's the only way it works. So I have to know beyond a shadow of a doubt that this person can do what they say they can do and that they have experienced what the client has experienced as well. So that means I need to dig into, like for a mortgage lender or a bank, I need to understand what the process and underwriting looks like for VA home loans. I need to understand how their loan officers, um, you know, what processes and systems that they have, you know, because there are, the lenders are a dime a dozen. You know how many more? How many organizations closed VA home loans in 2020? 12, it was something like 1,275. It's a lot of players in the game. Now the bottom half of those aren't really doing anything noteworthy. Mm -hmm. The top players are doing billions. And you want to know some of the top players? Like Quicken Home Loans is one of the top players. And I'm speaking as a professional who's worked with them before. They are the worst, the worst. And I will not give them business because I don't trust their process. I don't trust their people. And there's a lot of them that are like that. But there are also a lot of them that do really good. Guys like uh, New Day USA is probably arguably one of my favorites. They pay for your appraisal. That's 800 bucks in cash that you don't have to pay. I dig that. They also pre-underwrite people. So instead of getting a pre-approval letter and going shopping, they're looking at all of your financial documents and saying, no, an underwriter has seen everything. You're good to go. Here's your number. There's no surprises. And sellers like that too, because it's not a pre-approval letter. They've gone deeper. So little things like that, that they've been thoughtful about the process. They've been thoughtful about giving value. And, and that's what we're looking for. So, but when it comes to the investing part, you know, it's, we definitely have a system for who we're looking for. Again, I don't just want the money. This is a partnership. And you're only looking for U.S. investors or you take investors from outside the country or? Yeah, just, right now, just U.S. Just U.S. Yeah, just U.S. And because we're registered, how we're registered with the SEC requires us to stick with the U.S. investors. So how you do this, like, it's like everyone in your company is better related or better, right? Mm -hmm. And that's mm -hmm. great. However, comma, like my experience in the Army, like I had people who work, worked with me, worked for me, or I worked for right. who I would not hire to cut my grass right now. Mm-hmm, mm-hmm. I mean, how do you make sure these veterans you hire, which is a great thing you're doing, yep. that can actually do the job yeah. and actually qualify? What's your process question. for that? So, like, think about being a, a real estate agent, you know, somebody who's going to show homes, right? Um, if you've watched HDTV before, then you probably know how to show homes. The actual mechanical part of doing the job is pretty simple. So, the thing that we're most bullish about is we have a three week onboarding process. You read six books or listen to them if you want to do audiobooks. And there's a series of short videos that ask you questions and really drive points home that are important, not just about, like I view it as the meta basic training. And that is how we treat it. There's three phases. Phase one is onboarding, like MEPS, right? Phase two is basic training. Phase three is AAT. That's how we treat our onboarding. So you're getting your legal stuff, your payroll done in the very beginning, but then you're going into everything about the company and what it is that we're here to do and why we're here. We're talking about the meta deep level of, you know, one of the biggest things that I think companies fail on is how they onboard their employees. Most of them are, here's your desk. You know, your job responsibility. Let us know if you need anything. It's only a desk. There's no email set up, no that's computer. It. That's it. And a lot of times the stuff, the last person of the job is stuff that's still in the desk. That's right. Yeah, hundred percent. And that's the wrong way to do it because now all that person knows is their isolated part of this conversation. They don't understand how, what they do on a daily basis impacts 
the organization and impacts the missions that we're trying to accomplish here. Yeah, what I always tell people to get a new job, I said, whenever what your onboarding process is, do your best to help meet with everyone at least once for 15 minutes. 100%, yeah. I mean, pre-COVID cost them perfect. Whatever, yep. Yep. know what they do, the janitor, yeah. the, anything yeah. you can do lunch with, learn from them. We're very bullish about, I want people to understand the why of everything that they do. One of the biggest things that frustrated me about the military and my parents, especially, they never wanted to tell me the why. They said, this is the way we're going to do it. Now go. And I hated that because I was forced in some situations to make decisions with context that I wasn't given. And had they given me that context, I would have been able to make a decision that was in line with what they actually wanted. But because they failed to give me that, because either they didn't trust anybody below them or they wanted to feel powerful. And now I had to make a decision without that context. And sometimes I went right when they wanted me to go left, but they just didn't tell me. We're back to implicit expectations. Yeah. Right? So, so another funny story. I remember I just found my head. Yeah. So it was on so, somewhere social media where this family, they would always have like Christmas dinner, Thanksgiving dinner. And the, this piece of meat, they would, the mother always cut off this one piece, right? Mm -hmm. And it would easy, it would easy fit in the pan, right? Why, why you cut this off? Well, it was always been like that. Yeah. That's yeah. your mother. Oh, it's a great, yeah, and, great and, analogy. And so they went to the great yeah. grandmother. It's always been like, so finally I got a great, great grandmother. Yeah. Oh, I, I cut off because it wouldn't fit in the pan. Yeah, right. right. But now it could all fit in the pan. They're still kind of like a, a big piece of meat to, yeah. to fit in this big pan, yeah. right? Because no one asked. They said, why? Just kept on doing it. Nobody's asking why. It's a big problem. And so I'm putting them, like I'm giving them the entire foundational concept. Here's, here's my analogy. The company is up here. We've had years and years and years of growth and, and lean principles and learning and all these different things but you didn't have that experience as a brand new employee that's just coming into the company. Maybe you haven't read the books, but you definitely don't understand the context of where we came from and where we're going. So this three week onboarding process is meant to bring you from down here and bring you up here. Remember the concept about the apple, Yeah. right? Words mean things. And I wanna make sure that before they even begin their job, they understand the definitions of the words that we're talking about. That's the most important thing to me is that they get the context and the why of, because here's the thing, my employees aren't just workers. This is a war, real estate is a war to me. There's no bullets flying if you're doing it right. Um, but it's still a war. We still have an area of operation. We still have a set amount of resources. We still have good guys and bad guys, and we still have a mission. All of the elements of a combat mission and a war are present right here in real estate. There's just, it's a different enemy. James, are you partnered with any other real estate agents or agencies? Definitely. Yeah, no, we have a uh, non-operation red dot agents almost in every 75 bases that we operate at. And do they have to be military connected in any kind of way? 100%. Okay. Yeah, 100%. I'm not willing to give any military client that I have to a civilian. Okay. Not that I hate civilians. I don't. They don't know experience and background though. If you can't use the VA home loan for yourself, I'm not interested in talking. Okay. I, or I'm not interested in giving you a military lead. You, and same thing for lenders. You have to be able to use this for yourself. I've used the VA home loan multiple times for single family. I just bought a fourplex in 2019. I need people who understand what can and can't be done because the VA home loan changes all the time. They make changes to it monthly. Literally, there's over a dozen changes. Some of them are very minor and just, you know, administrative, but some of them are really big. So is it harder to use a VA loan than a regular home loan? Or is the process harder to go through for, for the banks? I think the process is pretty similar. You know, it, we're going to look at debt to income. We're going to look at credit, right? You, you have to qualify given certain parameters. But the thing about the VA home loan is the government is backing 25% if you default. Mm -hmm. So that's what gets you the better rate. Um, and there's a lot of benefits, like you can use, you know, seller paid closing costs or other closing costs to pay down debt. For and you, and you, don't, you don't have to pay what's called a PMI. You don't pay PMI. Yeah, no, no and PMI. And yeah. people don't realize how much money that PMI it's costs. Two or 300 bucks a month. Easy, easy. So there's all these kind of different benefits that you get. Um, and that's why we're so tuned in to the people who understand it at a very deep level, because somebody might come to me who's never bought a home before and be like, I don't know what to do here. I just want to buy this house. Mm. Well, we're shamans in a way where we've been down this path hundreds and hundreds and hundreds of times. And we have, a, we have a blueprint, we have a template that works very, very well. So, yeah. So James, how does the army prepare or not prepare you to be an entrepreneur? Oh, I love that question. Again, I don't agree with everything the military does, right? 
um, or the, the philosophies that they have. Uh, but combat and thinking about things, uh, you know, because I was a scout. So combat theory and psychological warfare were two things that I invested a lot of time in understanding at a philosophical level um, to be able to understand how to respond to contact and how to use psychology to change people's opinion of facts and, and situations and show different perspectives. So my thesis as an entrepreneur, as a veteran entrepreneur, is combat theory can be converted and applied to any business. And that really like thinking and, and that back to what I was talking about with the employees. My employees don't wake up thinking that they're going to work. We wake up every day thinking we're going outside the wire today. It's a war. And when you really look into it, it's like, man, this, it feels like it, you know, it's a battle. And so every employee from top to bottom wakes up like they're deployed with that mindset, not like we're going to go into a firefight, but the underlying idea, like when you think about any time that you just had a job, I think about all the jobs that I've had. I didn't think strategically about anything. I just went and did my job because that's what they asked me to do. But my employees are here to fight a war. And, and that's how we wake up. So we apply combat theory to real estate um, and business in general. As an entrepreneur, I, I apply it to the business. And so I think that experience of understanding how to navigate in an environment that is unknown, that has good players and bad players, and I only have this amount of resources, you know, back to the elements of what war is and applying that to business, when you think about it through that way, back to the 3D glasses, right? I, I apply combat theory as if those are the glasses to everything that I see. And I believe when you look at it strategically like that and your competitors aren't, they're just, hey, we have a product, we're trying to sell it, we have a market, we're gonna do this thing. I don't think even major companies are looking at it with the level of precision and strategy that combat veterans who have been to war and fought an enemy face to face. I just don't think there's a comparison to that. And I, I think it gives veterans advantages. I think one big fan of advantage about being a military and entrepreneur in the military, they do a good job of teaching you get knocked down 10 times. Mm -hmm. you, you better get up to the 11, right? hundred percent. Like you better yeah. get up to the 11. There's no, there's no sitting down. You, you yeah. better get up the 11 time and you better take care of the people on your left or right. Yeah. That's, that is the other thing is you think about how you changed going through basic training. And even me who had a, you know, loose military experience, you know, with the, with the auxiliary program, um, you don't come out of basic training the same in wars the same way. You, know, you don't, you don't come back from war the same person. So you're changed at a DNA core belief level on how the world works. And so I think people who have those experiences and even basic training, because again, that teaches you drive. It teaches you accountability. It teaches you preparation teaches you a lot of different things, right? A lot of, a, a lot of good things. And I think all of those things, you know, the lessons you learn from basic training and especially from combat can be applied to being an entrepreneur. And I think it's going to give you a, an advantage over your competition and others that are in the field. Yeah. That's one thing I think the military don't get enough credit for how culturally diverse they are. Right. Yeah. I mean, I, I work with so many different people. Yeah. And so I have from basic training, we have basic, basic training, we had a black guy from the Bronx hmm. and, a, and a white guy from the Appalachians of Kentucky, right? Yeah. The black guy had never seen a white person. Yeah. White guy never seen a black person. Yeah. And, they, and the black person said, I would never work with a white person. Yeah. The white person said, I'm not working with black people. Of course, yeah. they made a mistake and sat in front of the drill sergeants. Ooh. And they made them roommates. And of course, yeah, right. of, course <laughs> of course, you know what happens after basic training, their best of friends. Yeah. Go on, they're going to like each other's families for basic training dinners and stuff, you know? Yeah. I on that topic, because we deal with that everywhere. Racism in general is a problem everywhere you look. And it's the core ideology of, of what it is, is flawed in so many ways. And that is one thing that I deeply appreciated about the military. There's still racism in the military, and I think it needs to be snuffed out. Um, it's just unacceptable in every single way. But the military forces you to deal with that. And traveling also opens people's minds. Oh yeah, definitely. Like, like I have so many people back in Odessa, Texas, you mm -hmm. know, towns I grew up in, like yeah. 
they think, you know, like going out of town is going to million Texas, 20 yeah. miles away. Yeah, right? that's right. That's like right. They have never been opened up any, any ideology or nothing like that. This is back to what we were talking about offline about objective reality. There's a, such an amazing TED talk um, on YouTube about this. Uh, it's only like 15 minutes, but it's so powerful talking about how our society, the human race has lost objective reality. And when people have their blinders on and they're just focused on what's right in front of them, that's all they know. So if I'm raised from birth to believe one plus one equals five, which you and I know is not true, but if I'm taught that from birth and that's the only information that I have, that's become a core belief that I have. So when you approach me when I'm older and you say, what do you mean one plus one equals five? Math says that's wrong. One plus one equals two. Very simple, right? But racism is the same conversation where this is a nature versus nurture and they had more nurture that told them that people of a different color or from a different cultural background are bad. And, you know, we should not treat them the same. Or how many times this happened where like somebody's like a whatever race and mm -hmm. they're racing against another race. Yeah. But their daughter or son marries that person, that race. Yeah. Yep. And then like three years later, there's pictures of this person, yeah. you know, playing with their, you know, biracial kid right, who right, they're right. racist against, right? Yeah, yeah. It's, it is an understanding of, of reality. This is a conversation about what you've been taught. And some of those go so deep that you're never going to change that person's mind. Yeah. It's, that's just what they believe at their core. Um, and it's sad. It's very sad to see, but I, I was very, there, I still experienced or at least saw it um, when I was active duty, but it was very few and far between. And I was more glad to see the people that are like, yeah, my family believes all of these things, but I see what's going on here. And I just think they're closed minded. So they saw it, yeah. but it took them moving away from that little town or moving away from the people who have those theses. And I'm, I'm a big believer in, Hey, go travel for a bit and come back and talk to me. Yeah. And we, we talk about this a few times. My thing is like, believe we want to believe your ideology, whatever it is, but at least we open the chance, the yeah. possibility there's a 1% chance that your idea is wrong. Yeah. Just be open to that. Like, and that is really part of the problem. I can believe one plus one equals five simply because I want to. And I'm, I'm just not going to be open to any evidence. It doesn't matter that you could have scientific objective proof that says I'm wrong. And I could just believe what I believe because I want to. Like all, like all the flat earthers going around oh now. My God. Like, yeah. Are you kidding me right now? Yeah. Are you serious? Right, right, right. 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 Like, <laughs> like, <laughs> no, earth is round. We checked. That was a funny NASA post. <laughs> No, it's, uh, but you're right. That's a, that's a great example of some wacky conspiracy theory where people literally are just drinking the Kool-Aid and that's all they're, they're so stuck in the Kool-Aid. They can't see past it. And that's a dangerous place for humans to be in general, like forget anything else. It's, it isn't a healthy way for a society to thrive. It's not a healthy way for you to live. You know, you're, what you're basically saying is I'm done growing. Yeah. You realize we're being hurled through the universe at like thousands, tens of thousands of miles per hour. The world is changing around us all the time. Yeah, we, I think we're only, we're only know by one to two percent of the universe anyway, right? Yeah, right? yeah, we know so little. And there's such a vast amount of information and education around us that, again, you don't know what you don't know until you do. And not even space, but just the ocean. Like, I think, yeah. I think the ocean is less yep. discovered than That's the space right. is based That's on right. percentages and stuff, you know? Yep. And that can easily be applied to really anything, any, any theory that we could have in, in our society. And I think racism is a big one. This shit's got to go. This shit's got to go. Yeah, no doubt. So this is my, my personal opinion. People agree or disagree. So my opinion, like any, any organization, one to five to 10% are actually doing something positive. Like they're adding yeah. value. Yeah. They're making themselves better, making the company better. They're doing extra stuff, you know, the volunteering, as you put yep. it, putting the good in the world. Yeah, yeah. The rest of them, I'm not saying they're doing bad stuff, like doing the bare minimum. Right. Why, in your opinion, do some people have this, what I call a drive? Mm -hmm. and some people don't have that drive. I hate the word woke. I think that's the stupidest word in the world. But what it stands for is having your eyes open to something bigger than you. And I think when you, when you have this idea of putting good into the world with no expectation of return, it teaches you things about yourself and also puts a fire in you to do something bigger than you. And so I think that can happen at a corporate level. I think the, you know, the leaders that lead through action and, and do it themselves are going to create a good culture that, that creates that. And then there are other cultures where it's very clear that they're just doing you know, like you said, the bare minimum, 
or they're doing it for other reasons. They're doing it because they believe the company needs to be seen as doing good things, but they don't really believe in it or care about it, right? And so I think if you've never been exposed to putting good into the world without an expectation of return, you need it. But that's, I, I think that's the unlock. You know, these are doors that are kind of closed in, in a normal world. But once that door gets open, it opens up a whole bunch of other doors too. And once you kind of see the benefit and how you feel putting good into the world without an expectation of return, it changes your new lens, right? New, new 3D glasses. Now you can see something that's never been there before. I think people need their, their eyes open to a certain extent on what can happen, you know, how, how this can work. And so I think that's the trigger. Something has to bring you into the world where you can pick up a new set of glasses and, and look. I think the challenge too is like, like the people who are doing the bare minimum, it's like they, they, they get mad when the person advances, right? For example, yeah. when I was on an officer, we had two E5s, right? Mm -hmm. One E5, like he would volunteer stuff, he would do extra stuff, always be helping out, you know, he, like, he was like a top notch, right? Yeah. The other E5, like he was great at PT, right? And great at weapons, but he would work nine, nine to 11 30, go to lunch with his family. Yeah. Go to five, like every time we're training, hey, you want to go to so and so do a six month training? No, I can't go. Other person always go, right? Yeah. And they both have seen yeah. family, right? But every time it was time for opportunity to give out opportunities, right? That's right. We would always go to the first person, right? Yeah. And the second person always follow a complaint, you know, and they're both white men, you know. Right. So one of five complaints, why did he's opportunity? Not, and we're trying to explain to him, this is this, this. Well, that's not, it's not fair, right? He yeah. just didn't get it, right? Like you got to put out a little forth, like, some effort, right? Like, right. I understand you have a great PT score, but what else are you doing, right? Right. You're averaging your job. Yeah. When we need a volunteer, you, you disappear, right? Yeah. Yeah. And, and some people don't get it, right? Have you ever seen the, the US Marine Corps performance review? Like, have you actually seen the document? No, I have not. Jocko did a podcast about this, about being an M. So in, Marines call it being an eminently qualified Marine. And this was a game changer for me when I put it in the context of how do I rate myself and others in the organization? And what Jocko was, what he did was he said, we can convert, and I highly recommend you look this up. You can find it online. Um, it is one of the most powerful reviews that I've ever seen because um, it's, I think it's actually called a, perf a physical performance review, but only like five or 10% of it is about running or push-ups or whatever. And the majority of it is more about how you are at your job. What do you know technically proficiently about your job, but it's also about how are you leading others around you? And that's, you know, it's a very powerful rubric that can be converted into the business world. And that's what we did. So we have what we call the elite strategic assessment tool. And we converted that U.S. Marine Corps performance review for Operation Red Dot. And so every, uh, every six months, we're going through that with every employee and talking through what does it really mean to be a five? And we're mentoring and coaching how you get from a two to a three, a three to a four, a four to a five. And, and that podcast from Jocko was just insanely powerful and hit me in a really, really big way and opened my eyes to how do you objectively look at yourself? Because everybody wants to, you know, everybody wants the five, right? But the military doesn't allow that. You can't give, you know, if I have a, a team of 10, they can't all get fives. That isn't how the performance review is structured. Somebody has to get a lower score. And of course, the perspective that has always been like, what if you're like, you're rating four, four people, right? Yep. You only give one a top block. Yeah. Yep. What if by happenstance, all four of them, like fucking great as yeah, hell, like they're all right? superstars, right? Yep. You, you know, and then another, another person has four people, they have to get one of one block too. Yeah, yeah. But all four were duds, right? Yep, yep. And sometimes it just comes down to luck and where your location at, who your boss is. It's totally true. Only, and, and where you are in the promotion scale. Yeah, also only matters. fair thing about yeah. the Army system is it's unfair to everyone. Yeah, that's right. That's right. So our performance reviews are not promotion related. They're not punishment related. They are purely to build you as a human being and as a leader. I don't care if you're a bottom person that doesn't have anybody under them, I'm building you to be a leader. So let me take on this. And I think a lot of people get this wrong, right? So you, you have a company, right? And a person comes to you, hey, I'm leaving the company. Yeah. I think too many people take a person like, yeah, right. why, why are you leaving me? Like, yeah, right. You, you're a piece of shit, you know, talk about it. Yeah. And my point of view is someone leaves you for a better position. Yeah. You're a great leader. You, yeah, you, yeah. I mean, you've improved that person, right? Yeah. Like, 
and 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 the person leaves, they're gonna talk good about your company. Yeah. Hey, James made me a better person. He gave me his opportunity. He trained yep. me. I can take this better opportunity. Right. Too many people are like, you're leaving me. You're a piece of shit. Yeah. Right. You're right, not right. loyal. All yep. that kind of stuff. Yep. I'm like, I just this blows my mind with people like that. Google actually has, um, and not that Google is the most ethical company in the world, but <laughs> um, Google has a program that encourages their engineers um, and financially helps them as well. Um, to take what they want to do and go build a company around it. And I think that is the right thesis. I have that thesis as well. I want to help people get to positions that they want to be in because we're everything under one roof. Like you said, first part, like putting good in the world. Yeah, you got somebody right. start a company, you have somebody that's right. get a better paying job. Yep. Then they're going to go back on social media and say, yep. James and his crew helped me. I'm here because of James. That's right. That's right. And and I don't do it for that recognition, but I want to pour as much as as much resources as I, as I possibly can into my employees. I want them to be the strongest they can be. And I want them to know that if they want to leave or they're they're given some better opportunity that I'm going to encourage that. I'll write them the letter. I'll go talk to the person that they're trying to hire with directly. Like I'm going to help them be the best version they can be, whether they're with Operation Red Dot or any of my other companies or not. It doesn't matter. Because I want you to go forth and and be better. It's audacious for me to think that people are going to work for me forever. Or that they're going to work for me for any period of time. Or like people say, my come to the family. Uh, no, no, it's not. No, no it's that's, not. That's not a that's family. That's the biggest red flag for a company ever. If you, if, if on the job ad they have, we're a family here, run. Just that's the wrong. They're going to, they're using that as a mask to take advantage. And, oh, we're a family, so we're going to pay you lower. Yeah, exactly. We're a family, so you're going to work extra hours. Oh, friends and family discount, right? Here, here's, your, here's, your, here's your birthday cake for no, your birthday, right? No, no, no. We, that's we, a don't, we don't do any of that. Um, we're a team, right? We're here to accomplish a mission. You'll never hear Operation Red Dot employees or family. Like, and I love these guys. I love everybody, but I, I don't, I, I think that's a horrible approach. So here's a question for you, James. So let's suppose that, you know, you always talk about adding value, giving value stuff, right? Suppose this person you know, and like you've done some of this person, like maybe five, six, seven times, right? Yeah. Nothing major, nothing big, yeah, but yeah. you know, it happened five, six, seven times. And then you need something from them, right? Yeah. And for whatever reason, they say no. Mm -hmm. And you, but you know, they can do it for you. They just choose not to. Sure. And we say two weeks later, they come back to you for another, you no, know, something else. Sure. Do you keep on giving value to them, or do you have a cutoff point? How do you deal with those situations? I think my initial response would be to err on the side of I'm going to give them value no matter what, because again, it's I'm giving value without the expectation of return, mm -hmm. right? Um, now there is, I, I think there is a, an objective cutoff for that employee doing what they need to be doing, right? And so looking at it overall, and again, I think that's where the performance review comes in and, and mentoring and coaching. Again, I'm not using most, the reason that people don't like performance reviews is because they're used um, to really push you down. They're, they're used to say, oh, well, you're not doing things right. And so you're gonna be punished because you didn't get a very good score. And that's why I'm so bullish about these performance reviews don't have any implications on promotion or punishment. How often do you performance reviews? How often do you do those? Twice a year. Okay. Yeah, twice a year. And then we have check-ins um, throughout that are unofficial, more like the, the supervisor is checking in to, hey, how you doing? You know, which we do almost monthly, sometimes more depending on their role. Um, but the performance review has a section for things outside of the business has a section for how you feel like you're doing with family time. If you have a family, how you're doing with the things that you're passionate about outside of, uh, you know, we're big space nerds. And so, you know, <laughs> we do, we have other hobbies outside of work. And I want to make sure that I'm encouraging them to spend time on that. Um, and that they're edifying themselves, not just professionally, but also personally, uh, because I don't believe employees are strictly just a personal or a, a professional asset. I want you to incorporate other parts of your life so you don't feel like they're separate things, right? So, you know, yeah, I think there is, like if you're not performing and you're not technically doing the job and things are falling through the cracks, we're gonna have conversations, but my number one focus is mentorship. My number one focus is how do we help you be the best version of yourself? You know, back to the Paul Akers book, the, the Two Second Lean, you know, making, small incremental changes on a daily basis. When I look at myself in the mirror, this is an interesting point, and I really drive this into my employees as well. Every morning, this morning, I did this, I did this this morning, I do it every morning. I look at myself in the mirror 
And I'm not asking myself how I can be better than our competitors, how I can be better than other people. I am the only competitor. Who I was yesterday is the only competitor that matters. And so when I look at that, I'm looking at, okay, objectively, who was I yesterday? And how can I improve by two seconds, just a micro amount, but I do it every single day. And that's my, that's my 3D glasses. That's how I'm looking at this entire thing is um, I don't want employees comparing themselves to other people. That's not an objective comparison. I don't compare myself to other real estate companies because that's not an objective comparison. All I can do is make sure that me and everybody within my organization is focusing on being the best version of themselves. Well, that isn't just the business. That isn't just your job. Your happiness in life is a pie. Your job is just one of those slices. That's it. And so we're very bullish about making sure that you're incorporating, you know, that you have family time and you're being paid appropriately and that you're incorporating hobbies and things that you're passionate about into work, right? We allow our employees to um, bring ideas to the table that things that they're passionate about that correlate to the business. My, my thesis is all good ideas get funded. <laughs> and so that may mean that you bring an idea to the table that stems off in a new division of the company. And maybe instead of doing this job over here, now you're leading that division because it was your idea. It's a very flexible environment. James, can you tell a story about the name of the company? Sure. Yeah. Operation Red Dot. Um, started this in 2016. And it really came down to the reticle on a rifle, an actual red dot. For housing, a lot of people feel like it's out of range that it can't be achieved for one reason or another. Credit's not good, or you know, I don't wanna buy right now or whatever. Um, but housing in general seems out of range for a lot of people, especially lately. A red dot is meant to bring things that are far away into focus and make it easier to zero in on. And so when you look at our, our, our new logo that's about to get, you know, we're, we're going through a, a rebrand for a national, you know, to be a national company. The actual logo is a red dot, but the dot is a house. And the new catchphrase is going to be housing within range. Nice. And so the idea is let's take something that you think is far away and make it close. Let me put it into perspective. Let me bring it into focus. So you talked about some earlier, but like, I'm a firm believer that any entrepreneur now, they have some kind of entrepreneurial journey as a kid. Like either they cut grass, they sell yeah. newspapers, yep. or they, you know, sell lemonade. Yeah. Do you think that's yeah. a true statement or... Do you think people can wake up one day at 30 years old and say, I'm going to be entrepreneur? Do they have some kind of background as a kid? I don't think it's something you're born with. I think it's environmentally based. So, you know, how you were raised, the people that are around you, I think all that matters. Um, for me, as a kid, that's how it was. My parents don't have an entrepreneurial bone in their body. You know, nobody that I was around really lit that up for me. But like I said, it, it, you know, I, I felt drawn to it in the first place. And once I got a taste of it, I, I loved it. So I do see a trend in the entrepreneurs that I have in my orbit that they were doing something as a teenager. They were doing something as a kid. You know, the lawn mowing, the snow shoveling, the newspapers, they found a way to hustle. Yeah, I think Gary Vee is the most famous example, right? He was oh, like selling yeah. baseball cards, 11 years old, and right. making big bucks. I mean, he's the most well-known right. example He's right a now. great example. Yeah. Gary Vee has a hell of a story. Uh, but there's no doubt that I, it's environmentally based. I think this is a nature versus nurture conversation as well. And I think you just have to, at some level, be exposed to it. I don't think that you wake up one day and be like, I'm going to go be an entrepreneur. Um, those people probably aren't going to do as well because you, you have to be drawn to it in a, in a path. You have to be passionate about it because it is the grind of all grinds to be an entrepreneur. You're giving up the ability to leave work at work and to have a nine to five schedule or, you know, the basic stuff that working a job is going to give you a paycheck. I'm not even on my own payroll. Not, not a lot of people know that, but I haven't been on my own payroll for over five years. Now I've invested in real estate wisely and have multifamily properties and I have VA disability as well that allows me to be financially free. If I never worked on another day in my life, my bills get paid. I'm not rich off of that money, but my bills get paid. I can live the lifestyle that I want to live. And that's growing year by year. I'm adding new properties to the mix. We've got this big program going, you know, so we're, we're doing things, but the point is, 
it has to be something that you are deeply and unapologetically passionate about. That's why anybody who comes to me and says, I want to build a business that does this because it makes a lot of money. I'm walking away right there. Like that's no, that's the wrong answer. You need to be, you're going to put so much blood, sweat, and tears for lack of a better term into what you're building. And a lot of people are probably not going to see the vision. A lot of people are going to hate. Um, you have to believe in what you're doing deeper than anybody else and then be able to articulate that in, in a pretty serious way. And so, yeah, I, I don't think it's something you just wake up one day and say, I'm going to do. Now, you can, but we're back to the you don't know what you don't know. Because this is a, you know, it takes 10,000 hours-ish to master something. And so if you're just going to wake up one day and be like, I'm going to be an entrepreneur, you're going to fail. And, and I'm not saying that as a bad thing. I'm saying it as you need to know that you're jumping in with both feet and learning the hard way. And so maybe think more about the 90-10 rule. So James, let's talk about sales real fast. Like a lot of entrepreneurs, they build a product where it's tech, hardware, restaurant, they build a business. Yep. They spend time on social media, market, whatever. But come to sales, they want to run it right, right? They're like, yeah. they, they want to do it or yeah. they're, they're outsourced it, you know, whatever the case yep. may be. They're like, they'll do the training, but they don't pick the call. They don't pick the phone or, or call or whatever right. the case may be. What has, has been your process or your philosophy on doing sales? My, what I preach is we don't sell anything. We don't sell. And this comes down to philosophy and, and sociology in a big way. People don't want to be sold. That's why people don't like going to used car lots, right? Because they know the second they walk in, somebody's going to try and manipulate them into doing something that they don't want to do. And so our sales philosophy is we don't actively sell. We have solutions to offer. And we're going to do what we can to consult with the people that are in the market for that kind of thing to make sure it fits. But we're not going to sell. We're going to explain and articulate what we have and how it benefits them. And they get the choice. They can ask questions. We can talk about it. But we, at the lowest and highest levels, are very, very particular on not manipulating people, even subconsciously, into our product. And I think a lot of entrepreneurs and salespeople in general, like I worked at Best Buy, that's a sales driven job, right? That was as a teenager. Um, but we had quotas to meet, which means if we didn't hit our quota, there was punishment for lack of a better term. You know, there were, there were consequences. And so that kind of sales environment is if you don't make your quota. So if, if you need to make two more and you have, you're on the last day of your quota, um, you need to push people into that, whether they need it or not because you have goals to meet. I hate that thesis. I hate every bit of it with every bit of my being. I just think it's, it's not, nobody wants to be sold. So the better way is to connect people with solutions that fit what they need. And that means you have to have a product that actually fits the demand, that actually fits. Because that's the thing, if you've got the right product and you're presenting it in a very agnostic way, you're gonna sell a lot of shit. Like how many entrepreneurs like, they do a product demo, so to speak. Yeah. And they just do features. It does yeah. this, does that. Yeah. And, and they forget to, to show how that the product is going to solve that person's challenge or problem. It's the biggest thing. You know, I think in sales training that you see a lot, it is about pumping the features, features and benefits. And that's all that salespeople really focus on. Here's what this thing can do. But you're right. A lot of people leave the impact of what it actually does to make their life better. Because that's what a product is supposed to be. A product or a service is supposed to impact somebody's life in a positive way. Should make their life better, easier, faster, better. So James, earlier you talked about using facial recognition and playing poker. Can mm. you expand on, on, your, on your love and passion for poker on? I love poker. God, it's such a fun game. The only game in the casino that's against the other player, right? Instead of the house. I don't, that's why, I, I mean, I play blackjack, but I don't like it. Because um, the odds just aren't in your favor, unless you're cheating um, <laughs> or counting. Um, Poker is a game of wit and, um, and psychology. And when you really dive into the, you know, how the best professional players play, which I spend a lot of time looking at, um, the facial recognition, and not just facial recognition, but body language, nonverbal body language in general, plays such a big role. And I think if you can get really good at poker, you're gonna get good at a lot of other things too, right? Because this trait, this uh, skill, correlates to so much other stuff. And so there's nothing I love more than 
calling out somebody's cards, right? I'm, I'm putting them, you know, from, from the beginning of the hand to the end. And by the end, um, I've got a pretty, you know, I've got them narrowed down to one to three hands. And, you know, there's like Daniel Negrau, who's been a major player in the game since the early days of the World Series of Poker, um, is very, like, he's the best professional I've ever seen at doing this. He'll call it out at the table. He's go, oh, you've got queen 10 of hearts. And they're like, you know, are, is my hand translucent? How are you doing this? And he does it consistently. And so, you know, that's honestly a big piece of what makes poker players good. If I can see those um, subconscious tells in your face, I can read what you're thinking. And so pe how, people give a lot of stuff away without knowing. How often are you able to play poker? Not as much as I would like. If, if I weren't an entrepreneur, I would be a professional poker player. Like that, that is a fun life to me. Do you have a group of friends you play with like all the time or you play with different people? Yeah, I think when I'm playing these days, because time is limited, I'm normally at the casino, you know, playing one, three, no limit. What which casino do you usually go to? Uh, I've got a place called Palace in, okay. in Tacoma okay. that I play at. But, you know, there's there's places, uh, you know, the, the Muckle Shoot had a pretty nice room. Uh, they're closed down right now. But, um, you know, I, I play where I can. And then I do home tournaments as well. You know, just $20, $30 buy-ins. People are just messing around. And those are often the most fun because those guys don't know what they're doing. <laughs> <laughs> Pretty easy to place in the money on they're those. They're probably there just to hang out with friends and Absolutely. drink Absolutely. And, and you know what? So am I, right? Yeah. I, I don't go to those home yeah. games thinking I'm going to crush these guys yeah. and take all their money. Now I do, but I also have a lot of fun <laughs> doing it, right? And and so does everybody else. And that's the fun part about the home games. I'm, sure I'll, I'll have my, I'm about to lose this $30. Right? Absolutely. That, that's, that's the interest fee to have a good time. I could go to the movies and pay 30 bucks or I could, you know, sit here for the next six hours and, you know, play psychological games with everybody and have a good time and laugh. And, you know, everybody's cracking jokes and it's just fun. Let's talk about pool. So you play pool a lot too. So do you just play pool to play pool? Or are you like one of those people like, no, here's a geometry of it. Here's an angle. Yeah, here's yeah. a physics. Are you one of those type of players? I met a really interesting cat in my early years of the army up in Wainwright. And before he came into the army, he was a professional player. He actually played the pro pool circuit. And I watched this guy. He always had headphones in. Didn't He was very introverted, didn't really talk with other people. But when I saw him, and this was at the rec center on Wainwright, so they had two or three pool tables there. And this guy would shoot drills. He'd shoot the sh same shot 500 times in a row. And he would make the better majority of them. Let me give you context as to how good this guy was. Normally, you call a shot, right? Hey, I'm going gonna, I'm gonna to hit the seven ball in the corner. He wouldn't call shots. He would call where the cue ball was going to land within a six inch circle on the table. This guy was incredible. That's insane. So I tapped on this guy's shoulder one day and I'm like, bro, I've never seen anybody play like you play. What would it take to learn from you? And he goes, um, I'm not really interested. Shit, man. All right. Thanks. But I kept bugging him and I kept bugging him and kept bugging him. And he see me. I'm, I'm in the rec center. I mean, I'm single at the time had nothing to do. So I'm in the, I'm playing pool four or five nights out of the week. And, uh, he finally caved and said, all right, if you can, if you can commit to five nights out of the week and doing tournaments and, and doing all the, you know, he had criteria he said, these, these are the things that you need to do to learn to play. Like I play the next six months, we're basically getting smoked. I think I won one game against him and he beat himself. Like he accidentally hit the eight ball in, but I did the same thing. I would come and we would shoot drills 500, you know, uh, just an immense amount of shooting the same shot, but we're talking, you know, complex stuff like bank shots and double rails and just all kinds of crazy shit. And eventually just like the military, they teach muscle memory. Right. When we're when we're training, we're training to build that muscle memory so we don't think about it. So it turns into something like breathing. Right. And I love that concept of building muscle memory. I do it in everything that I possibly can. I want to repeat an activity over and over and over and over and over and over and over again until I don't have to think about doing it. It just comes naturally. I could do it with my, you know, blindfolded. And that's how pool became to me. And so I'll, I'll tell a fun story. Um, in, in Fairbanks, right outside the base, they had a pool hall at like 15, 16 tables. And then they had a retail center. And above the checkout stand, the, in this wooden shadow box case was this Lucasi Q, 800 bucks. And it was gorgeous. 
red pearl inlaid spears and black and red wrap. The thing was just the sexiest pull cue. And that sounds weird to say, but it's just so sexy. I wanted this thing, but I'm like an E2 at the time. I'm certainly not paying $800 for a pull cue. And these other private MPs would come into the, you know, into the rec center and they drink and MPs like to get drunk. And so they would come up and be like, Hey, let's play for 10 bucks a game. Okay, like, yeah, cool. All right. And this guy's training me in the background. So I'm, I'm at this point, I'm fairly sharp and definitely, I'm still not ever going to be on his level. But so I start playing these guys, these guys, and I'm playing tournaments in the background as well. And I wasn't a star out the gate, but I started winning more. And these guys are not pool players, you know, these MPs. And so we'd play 10 bucks a game. I'd win a couple. They come, all right, double or nothing. Let's do this. All right, 20 bucks, let's go. You know, put it up, you know, like uh, pool, pool hall junkies <laughs> type, type level. Um, and about four or five months later, I bought that Lucasi Q mm. in cash. None of my own money. Nice. And I still have that Q. Um, I play. You still use it? Oh, yeah, absolutely. Yeah, absolutely. Pool is, um, that's one of those that I like to put my headphones in. And it's a headspace. It's a headspace. You're, it is a, a geometry it's very you know geometry focused a lot of people don't realize that yeah absolutely angles yeah. and that kind of stuff yeah and and that's what it was i was a bad pool player before because i i didn't have the muscle memory of what it took to make a simple bank shot you know i i just you need those skills to be a good player and so pool and poker are very similar to me in the way that you build a lot of muscle memory and you need a lot of practice you need to see different situations and okay, I went a little bit too far left on that one. I need to do a little bit less next time because you see the same situations come up over and over and over again. And so you learn over time and through muscle memory, the right way to do it. And so that guy forced me and I hated his drills. I hated them. They were, I'm like, why aren't we just playing pool? And he, you just don't get it guy. That's, that's what he would tell me. You don't get it guy, shoot the drills. And I get it now. I get it now. And so again, just like anything else, like being an entrepreneur, that's my life. Like I'm married, I'm married to that life. And so I don't get a ton of free time. You know, most of my life is spent, you know, I, I have a weird sleep schedule too. So I'll be up till one or two in the morning at my desk working, like doing stuff, strategy or writing offers or, or whatever I'm doing. And then I'll sleep in till, you know, eight or nine. So James, you're a big travel guy too. Mm -hmm. Um, two part question. First part, what's the favorite place you traveled oh, to? Yeah. Second part, what's the place you went to where people were like, you went where? Like, <laughs> you went where? Why are you? Why would you want to go this place? Yeah, right, right, right. I'll answer the last one first because that's that's a pretty easy one. I think when when I tell people that aren't in the military that I deployed to Iraq and spent time in Kurdistan and and other you know Kuwait and that, and I actually I stepped foot in Iran for a second. I actually shouldn't say that, but. Um, like that is one of the places where people who don't understand military, um, like why people join the military, they're like, why would you ever want to go and just be in that space? You know, and, and they just don't get it. So I think that's, you know, no people who weren't military affiliated never understood why anybody would want to go to Iraq or Afghanistan or the Horn of Africa or, you know, wherever, you know, um, they, and they just probably will never understand. My favorite place is a split. Uh, a couple of years ago, I flew down to San Antonio and experienced Texas barbecue for the first time. Yeah, I'm from the San Antonio area, right? Yeah. Like, yeah, Texas barbecue. That's a magical. Yes. Oh, people just don't realize. I can't even, I can't even stress enough. San Antonio is a great city. It was life changing. It was life changing. But then I road tripped from San Antonio to New Orleans. And New Orleans, earlier I was talking about a place that was like a parallel universe you're walking down bourbon street with a giant fishbowl full of liquor mm -hmm. and it's just normal. Yeah. Right. It was, it was, it was a, in fact, they look at your strange. You don't have a yeah, fishbowl. Right, like, right. Exactly. You're, like, drink, you're drinking water. Yeah. Right. You, you're drinking water in the morning. What's wrong with you? Yeah. For real though. For real. Like that's, that's the lifestyle down there. And I just, the music, I got so sucked into the music down there, the blues um, and the food down there was something special as well. Um, that's how I travel. When I travel, like, yeah, I'm going to see things, but I eat my way through, through cities. Uh, the food is like, I, I'm a big foodie 
and I, I love to cook. And the thing too, is, so. don't go to the tourist restaurant. Go, no, yeah. Go to the food truck. Go yeah, like, that's right. You know, that's right. Like in San Antonio, like on, on the river walk, yeah. the, the Mexican food is really not that good. Yeah, yeah, yeah. yeah. Expensive. Yep. But if you just drive six blocks to the south side, that's right. You can get a great meal for like <laughs> a third of the cost with better service. And just better everything. Yeah, Texas is a special place. It's got a special place in my heart. You know, what's funny is I'm only tied to Washington physically right now because we're setting up our JBLM mm -hmm. national headquarters and then we're going to start expanding. But once that's up and running, I'm not going to have a tether anymore. I can pretty much go wherever I want. So I'm kind of eyeballing some places right now. And Texas is on my list. San yeah. Antonio is on my list. Vegas is on my list uh, for obvious reasons. Um, Colorado on my list. Colorado wow. Springs, beautiful place. All good places, yeah. yeah. Denver is a good place. I don't like anything on the East Coast. Yeah. Like I'll visit, but I certainly don't want to live in Tornado Alley or freaking hurricanes. <sighs> like I give props to people who live out there, whether they have to or not. You know, it's uh, at least for the hur like a hurricane, at least you know it's coming right. Yeah, right, right, right. At least you yeah. know it's coming right. God, that last tornado that ripped through there. The tornado you don't know is coming at all. Instantaneous, and it was like five states. Yeah. Oh, damn. I just, I can't even imagine. And I, I have to think about those things. Like we talk about that as a risk uh, because if we own hundreds or thousands of homes mm -hmm. that our you know, military families are renting. Yeah, I can imagine the insurance bill you might have. It's huge. It's, it's huge, but it's, it's not just that. Those are our brothers. Mm -hmm. That's the biggest difference between a regular company and a veteran owned company in my opinion is we don't really view any of the people that we work with as customers or clients. These are our brothers and sisters. These are people that are to our left and right. And we take that a lot more seriously than just somebody that we're helping buy a house. Yeah, and back like the places you've been to, like a lot of people, like what are you around, for example? Yeah, yeah. The government states, a lot of people like, what's that guy's name? I think Rick Steves, who does all the travel stuff all the yeah, time. Yeah, yeah, yeah. He actually yeah. ran like, like a long time ago, right? Yeah. And he's doing, I was like, the film, like all the people, like, we love America. We love yeah, you. Like, yeah. And it's like, it's the people, the people are great. It's the government, yeah. you know, like, like, I would love to visit Iran, just the culture, the stuff they have down there. Afghanistan yeah. people, like they're great yep. people. It's like, well, it's, it's so funny looking at pictures from like the eighties and you got people walking around like it's normal life, yeah. you know? And it was, I mean, Iran's a gorgeous place, right? I mean, there, there's a lot of cool geography to see. It looks like Pakistan. A lot of people think Pakistan is like, you know, this desert thing. But when right. I was, I went to this, in the army school called ILE, it's for major, right? Mm -hmm. and you always, each, each, it's like 10 officers, like hundreds of them. You always had like one foreign exchange officer. Yeah. Ours were from yeah. Pakistan. Yeah. And you saw the pictures from his home, like, it's like, it's like a paradise. Yeah, right, right. Mountains, green rivers, like, yeah. this is Pakistan? Yeah, like, right, No, right. this is like, this is Pakistan. What you see is only like a 5% of our country That's that right. the war sees. And this lush stuff, like beautiful people, is like, yeah. no, this is real. What well, you see, this is like the bullshit like they show, you know? Yeah, that's, that's why I love travel. And honestly, that's why I love space, too. You know, you, you look at what astronauts say when they get up to the ISS, and they're yeah. looking back, and they're like, there are no borders. No. There are no borders. It's just this tiny blue marble floating, not even floating, being hurled through space. You know, it's that perspective is big. And I think travel gives that in a lot of different ways. You know, people only know what they've been taught. And uh, people aren't being taught the whole picture, you know? No, they're not. They're yeah. not. So next, let's talk about philosophy. Mm. Do you have a favorite philosopher or favorite philosophy? What do you want, want to say? Oh, man. Um, philosophy is such a big topic for me because I think we're taught in our public education system to just think about things. But I want to think about how to think about things. That's what philosophy is really about. And you're thinking at deeper levels. You're thinking uh, more layers deep into things and, and you think deeply about things, you're going to have a much better understanding around how things operate and what things do. I don't know that I have a favorite philosopher. I think Kant would probably be arguably one of my favorites, but meta ethics is probably my favorite topic because it really boils moral morals and ethics down to the core of what is this actually? And there's so much that's driven by culture and, um, and sociology, right? How groups of people, um, you know, groups of people can have morals. Uh, and there's this whole thesis of, you know, the, the group think that is very dangerous, yeah. you know, and like, obviously there's a lot of that going around right now. I talking about group, I think it was a few months ago, maybe early in that where was like, there was a situation in, I think Jersey on the train, mm. this lady got raped by yeah. this guy and everyone just watched. Yeah. Right. Like they, right. They, no one even just dialed 911. Like no one else is doing, I just, I'm yeah. filming, right. Yeah. Like, yep. I'm talking about group thinking like some, yeah, that's yeah. ridiculous. There is a India, unfortunately, has a lot of bad stories like yeah, that. Yeah, like right? groups of 50 men yeah, you know, raping right, like 15-year-old right. females. And well, there's, I heard one the other day, this, the son 
So as a son, mother, and daughter, I guess the daughter got pregnant and she was younger and the mom held the daughter down while the son beheaded her and there were no charges. This was, this was culturally normative. And so it's, it's fascinating to me. The brain is just a fascinating thing in general of humans, just how people think, but society and philosophy drives so many interesting facets of human nature. Like so many countries like there, you see that all the time, 55 year old man, you know, yeah. purchases a 10 year old yeah. wife, yep. you know? Yep. Yep. There's things that are just ethically mind blowing to me. And so I think meta ethics is probably my favorite thing to study. Um, but I, I do spend a lot of time, like a couple of years ago, I ditched Netflix because I was finding myself spending time mindlessly watching shows. Mm -hmm. And I picked up curiosity stream, which I highly recommend, but there's, there's all kinds of other things. We're back to the fact that, I mean, how many hundreds, how many tens of thousands of hours are added to YouTube every minute? Yeah. There's no, you could spend an entire lifetime. You'll never catch up with it. You I mean, know? YouTube, Twitch, Discord, yeah, right. all the content is out there. I mean, the content is so fast. And that's the crazy thing is we have access to everything, but nothing at the same time, yeah. you know? And so when I really sat down and thought about how I was allocating my time, which already is fairly limited because I spend a lot of time, you know, being an entrepreneur, building businesses, um, I wanted to use my off time more appropriately. And thinking about what are the things that could really matter? What, what are the things that are going to make me a better human, help me understand human nature and the world a little bit better? So talk about your time. Like, you know, entrepreneur, you have like 10,000 things going on. Right. How, how, do, how do you like day to day make sure you focus? You got to focus on, do you have a calendar, you have tools. Like yeah, yeah. And the second part, like, let's say you have other things you need to do tomorrow. Yep. And you have a practice one to 10. How do you make sure you do one, two, three, instead of jumping to number 86 and number 87? Yeah. Yeah. I'm a huge proponent of lists. I love lists. I love crossing stuff off the list. I love, you know, taking big lists and making them small. Uh, I do have a calendar. Uh, if it's not on my calendar, it doesn't exist. So oftentimes my wife asked me, what are you doing on like this day? <laughs> I love that question. Yeah, my, like, my friends do that. Yeah, like let me too. get my calendar. You don't know? You yeah. know what you're doing tomorrow? Like, no, I don't. What do you mean, do I know? Like, of course I don't. Let me no. look at my calendar. Just give me a second to push the button. I'll, yeah, I'll bring right, up my right, calendar, right? right. And yeah. it drives my wife like bash you crazy. <laughs> how do you not know what you're doing like two days from now? Because there's, you should see how many things are on the list. Yeah. You know, it's, I, you know, I generally I'm the night before looking at what's coming up for the day or, or two ahead. So I really run my calendar in two ways. I've got hard items. Like this podcast was a hard item, right? I, it's not movable. I need to be here at a certain time. But then there's also like tasks that I put on my calendar that says, these are things that actively need to be done. Because like you said, the, the way I define entrepreneurship to other people is think of like going to a circus and watching somebody, you know, they're like juggling. But what if like, you've also seen guys spin plates on sticks before. What if you were juggling spinning sticks uh, or spinning plates, you know, like eventually one of those is going to start to fall and you're going to go grab it and all of them are going to come crashing down. And that's kind of what entrepreneurship is to me. It's a very complex environment of um, a very highly technical task. And so you have to have order and structure and muscle memory really to, to be able to do it well. Um, and it's hard. It's hard to juggle all the things. You know, I don't have much of a social life. It, it definitely exists, but it's not much. Um, and that's, to me, it's, it's just a sacrifice for the bigger picture because being an entrepreneur in the beginning, getting the zero to one is the hardest thing. But to me, having a business and being an entrepreneur is about having something that runs with or without me. So James, how do you do this, right? Like some pe people, entrepreneur families work hundred hours a week. Some, yeah. you know, only work like nine to five. Mm -hmm. I have one friend, he works like 21 days in a row and takes Tuesday off. Yeah, sure. Me, I do my best, like at least once a week, take a two hour break where I just like cut sure. everything off. And you talked about something earlier about your sleep schedule. How do you do your schedule? How does that work for you? I think about it a couple of different ways. Um, you know, like poker, if, if I need to clear my head and be in a scatter focus mode, I'll, I'll go play poker for a couple hours or something like that. But I have a hard, fast rule um, that twice a year, I'm taking a weekend trip. I'll go rent an Airbnb 
and go, I'll turn everything off. I'll make sure everything's covered, you know, but I, I'm going to turn everything off and I'm going to, that's what I call my reset weekends. Um, and it's generally just me and it's generally at the ocean or in the mountains or in the rainforest here in Washington. Some kind of nature based thing, right? Absolutely. Yeah. And just go be in it, right? It, it's about being present because in my normal life, it's chaos. There's just a lot of things happening. I own multiple companies right now that all integrate together. And so there's just a lot of moving pieces, right? And so being able to check out and just kind of unplug for a little bit, I think is really important. Um, we talk about work-life balance a lot. And I'm sure if you've listened to Gary Vee at all, yeah, there's no um, such thing. there is no such it's thing as life, work-life balance, yeah. right? It's, it's integrating your life with work. Uh, and I think that's entrepreneurs really need to get heavy on, on understanding that. And I hear that question all the time too, or I hear people talking about it. Like, you know, and I've been told that from other people like, oh, you have a terrible work-life balance. Like, you don't know anything about me. If you're saying that, like I'm on a mission to build an empire and that requires investment and sacrifice. You know, what kills me? Like hear these people, the entrepreneurs, like they made it right. They, they had a company acquire their worth hundred million dollars. Yeah, yeah. And now they're saying, you know, you know, work, don't work weekends, don't work this. Yeah, like, right, right, right. Like, let's, Context let's, matters. Let's, Context let's, let's matters. go back when you just started. Were you doing this when you first started or were you grinding, right? But, but see, that's the point. I think that's, I think about entrepreneurship in phases. So like I'm in a startup phase right now, for, for lack of a better term. And I have $75 million in sales under my belt in the last couple of years for houses. Um, so I've been hustling, but I still view where I'm at right now as, as a startup. If you walked away from your business for a couple of days, does it continue without you or does it crash? Does it stop? Does it pause? That's what I define as a true entrepreneur. I don't think I'm an, on. I don't personally identify. I mean, I am an entrepreneur by trade, but I don't view myself as a true business owner because a business is an engine that runs and hums by itself. And so right now I have an elaborate job that requires a lot of time and a lot of input, a true business. I, as the owner, founder, CEO, however you want to title me, if I walked away for a couple of weeks, the business should hum without me, right? Uh, that's a true business to me. Before I hit that point, I'm in sacrifice mode. I'm giving my time and I'm giving my resources to build this thing up, to make the empire so I can get my time back. Because to me, money means nothing. Money is a means of getting time. That's time is the most valuable currency in my world. So James, how do you take care of yourself? Mm, that's a good question. I think in the beginning of my entrepreneurship career, I was horrible about it. Horrible. I would just put my head down and work for years and not even think about me, you know, two, two ways in particular that I'm really bullish about now. Um, one is food. So I do intermittent fasting and I'm on keto when I'm not on fasting. And so I'm really, really particular about eating right and then getting a minimum amount of sleep. So Matthew Walker is a sleep scientist out of the UK. He's been on the Joe Rogan show and uh, Lex Friedman and several others. Uh, he wrote a book. He talks about the science that's been done around the difference between something simple, like getting six hours and seven hours of sleep at night. And it's massive. Like the gap between just one hour a night is setting yourself up for failure if you're not doing it right. And we're talking about long-term health implications, like big, 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 big things. Yeah, right? me, I need seven. Like I, I can do six hours, like two or three days. Sure, sure. But four day, I, I can definitely yeah. say, right? I, my, my street point is seven. Yeah. And if it's funny, if I do like nine hours, yeah. it's the same as yeah. getting two hours. Yeah, that's right. That's right. So if I, I think balance is important in understanding what your body needs for sleep. In a perfect world, I go to bed and don't set an alarm. Now, I can't do that now, right? I, there's no way I could do that now. But letting your body choose how much sleep you get is, is the best way to do it if you can. Um, and then eating right, I think, is really, really big. Um, there's, we live in a world where processed bad food for you is immediately available and it costs a penny. And it's so easy to get. You so know? easy. I'm to hungry. Get. Let me go get this crap, you know. So easy. So I meal prep. I make, you know, probably two to three weeks worth of meals ahead of time. And I make a bunch of different meals. So I'm not eating the same thing every day, but I'm eating good food. And then I'm fasting every other day. Um, and I was so skeptical of fasting before I got into it. I'm like, I'm going to be miserable. Um, I'm going to be low energy. I'm not going to be, I'm not going to be able to focus. And I was wrong on every account. This, this questioned my understanding of what fasting really was. 
so a couple of years ago, I got into water fasting, right? Sure. And man, like the longest I've gone is 21 days, right? <laughs> That's and, a long time. And people are like, man, you're crazy you're doing it. But they, they, I've right. told people like, like the first day, second day, it's, it's, it don't go wrong. It's kind of hard. Like, yeah, it's, right, you got to right. test your discipline. Yeah. But day four or five, you, you just feel the difference, you know, yeah. your body cleaning up. And like, are you tired? Like, I, I had so much focus, right? Yeah. It's yeah. like, it is, it's like, to me, it's a game changer. Not, I'm not, it's not for everyone, you know, 21 yeah. days is kind of extreme. I'm, I'm definitely not doing yeah. 21 days. I but do, yeah. I do either every other day or I, I've just recently gotten into doing 40 hour, mm -hmm. uh, 48 hour fast. And they're great. Um, the biggest part is I hate the gym. After seven years in the army, oh yeah, waking up at four o'clock in the morning, which nobody is designed to wake up that early unless you're Jocko Willink. Um, you know, I just, I loathe working out and, but if I'm not conscious about what I eat, I'm going to get big. And that's part of me doing the water fast. Like I, yeah. I don't want the gym anymore. So yeah, right. 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 Here's my like little diet thing. You're, you're, you're tricking your body into changing your energy source from food that you're putting in your mouth to what you already have on board. Yep. And it's it, your body eats the bad kind of fat yeah. that you want to get rid of the visceral yep. stuff that makes your belly, you know? So I thought it was going to be a big deal. I thought I wasn't going to be able to do it, but I, I was willing to give it a shot. And it's the best change that I've made personally, uh, way more energy. I'm fitter, or at least I feel better about, you know, how I look, you know, cause I, even just a year ago, I was, you know, I'm, I think I weigh, you know, 225. Now I was 260. I was, you know, I was big. I, I didn't like how it looked. I don't care about weight. It means nothing to me. I, when I look at myself in the mirror, I'm like, am I happy with what I see? That's it. That's my only metric. So James, you have a saying, putting good in the world. Mm. Can you define that? What does putting the good in the world mean to you? I think it means putting yourself aside. Really? It's, it's putting ego at the door. Um, there have been several instances in my life. We don't need to go too deep into this, but I believe in uh, the effects of psychedelic mushrooms. That's a whole topic all of its own. But what it does is it forces you to put your ego, it, it's ego death ultimately. And I think, I think if everybody had the mentality of putting good into the world without the expectation of return, putting yourself aside and saying, what can I do for others? Uh, this world would be a much better place. When you look at our society right now, it's very selfish. It's very self-centered and it, it doesn't have a positive effect net on anything. But when you look at the people that are looking at just like their lens is, I'm going to help that person on the side of the road, or I'm going to, you know, it's simple things. It's not, you know, I'm not dedicating my life to it. It's I'm looking for simple opportunities just to be authentically good. It's a very simple mentality, but not many people have it. People are, are very organically selfish and sometimes subconsciously. Yeah, I think a good example is, um, I, th I think her name is Ellen DeGeneres, she, the, the, the host of the sure, TV sure. show. Yeah. Her thing is like, be nice. Sure. And something happened and like people clapped back on her and like got mad at her. Yeah, right. No, because she, she sat down with George Bush, the son. Sure. And people like got mad or whatever. She's like, sure. when I said be nice, I said be nice to everyone. Yeah, that's right. That's Not right. be nice to only people you agree with. Yeah, yeah. Don't be nice to people, yeah. you know, you want to get something from. Be nice to everyone. It's And, and that that is really what it means. It's there are no filters. There are no criteria. There's no exceptions. Um, it's just putting... I, I, I always like encouraging people to put good into the world. And, and again, that doesn't mean creating nonprofits and dedicating your life. I mean, that's great if that's what you want to do, but um, we all make decisions, hundreds on a daily basis, each of us. And the decision, the results of your decisions can be neutral, positive, or negative. And if you really log the very simple daily decisions you make, could be what you have for breakfast or what road you're going to take to work or whatever. It, simple decisions that we're making on a daily basis, you're going to see that you actually have the opportunity. You have a deliberate choice to make with every single one of those decisions and you make them. Sometimes you make them without thinking about it, but you make them. So if you're conscious about, I'm here to make a decision, where am I leaning? You know, there, there was a game called Fable that came out on Xbox years and years and years ago. And your character would actually change depending on the choices that you would make. So if you help a villager, you would get certain traits, right? And if you killed a villager, <laughs> uh, you would get certain traits, 
right? So we as a human race and as people get to make decisions about everything on a daily basis, but your decisions are leaning one way or the other. Very rarely are they just neutral. And so I think just the simple act of being conscious of what decisions you're making on a daily basis and how those impact yourself and the people around you uh, is, is a very positive thought exercise that makes people better in, in my opinion. So James, can you talk more about like in more detail, um, how you come to get started, like yeah. the idea phase, what you're focused on right now and what your business is. You already talked about something like going over like greater detail. Yeah, like do a yeah, yeah. On it. Uh, you know, like I said, I, I see the company as, or being an entrepreneur as being phase based. And so in the very, very beginning, I just needed to understand what it was that I wanted to do. I came in, um, I got my real estate license. This was 2015, 16. Um, I picked up my real estate license and I'm a brand new agent in a very saturated world of, of real estate agents here in the Puget Sound and in the JBLM area. Um, and so getting somebody to let me represent them in one of the biggest financial decisions of their life, arguably, um, it's not easy when you've done no deals, right? Um, as a brand new agent, I actually had two jobs. So seven days a week from nine to five, I was doing real estate, nine to five, nine to six, nine to seven, somewhere in that ballpark. Um, that means I was at the desk. I was actively working on my marketing plan. I was actively trying to find clients and six days a week at the Port of Tacoma, I'm driving a forklift for a transport company, one of the hubs, uh, just taking stuff off of trucks and moving them, you know, moving stuff around on a forklift um, from eight o'clock at night to 2 p.m. in the morning. I did that for six months and I was a zombie, absolute zombie, but the bills had to be paid. It was- I'm guessing not much of social life during that time period. Huh? Zero. That, it, was, it was like North Dakota, eat, sleep, work. That was it. That was it. It was, it was a true hustle. Um, but at the six month mark, because I dedicated the time I did to real estate, I had already closed two transactions and I had two more that were in the pipe to close that gave me a six month float. That means if I didn't earn another dollar on commissions for the next six months, my bills were paid. And so I quit the second job and never looked back. And so, like I said earlier, uh, to date, I think we're actually a little, uh, we're closer to 85 million in sales. Uh, in the real estate side, most of that was me. I've got a pretty small team um, that's about to be growing quickly with the new rent to own program going live. Um, but I hustled, I built a reputation. I also started building a brand. Notice a lot of real estate agents use their name as the brand, their face. Um, even before I started as a real estate agent, before I had my license, I knew I wanted to build a company that was bigger than me, something that could go national. And my focus in the beginning was just building relationships, closing deals, getting people the solutions that they needed, whether that was selling their home, buying it, rentals, you know, because I'm, I'm a property manager too. So, uh, and probably right around 2017, 18, I really started to build the foundation and the plans for the rent own program, which I believe is going to spearhead us into a national company. No question. There will be other things that come with it. Like I said, the storage unit facilities and all that kind of stuff. There's, there's other verticals that we have in mind for later phases, but I view the rent to own program as the thing that's going to launch us into being at 75 military installations around the country, maybe on the bases, um, you know, looking at possibly taking over the government contracts for privatized military housing also. So a lot of verticals in the future, but once I had the 75 million in sales that gave me the credibility to go to investors and say, Hey, I, we have a thing here. And really not that we've turned off the conventional buying and selling side, but now it's about fundraising. Now it's about getting investors and partners involved at a very high level, you know, millions and millions and millions and millions of dollars. So we can buy these homes. And I have to think you're going to invest right. You say I have seen five million dollars sales. Yeah. That's like, it has to be a door opener versus it I have is. an idea. I've done nothing. Yeah. I, I never, you know, after my first business where I raised money on a theory, uh, I told myself I was never going to do that again. I said, I'm going to, I'm going to hustle and I'm going to work my way up to give myself the credibility that shows investors and shows other people that I actually can execute this. 
And that's exactly what I did. I Operation Red Dot took no outside money from the, and we never have from the very beginning. And this, I'm not fundraising for Operation Red Dot. I'm fundraising for this program in a fund. So I'm not, I'm not selling shares. There's no equity investment into the company. It's you're buying into a, a an investment, a fund. And so Operation Real Red Dot will never take outside money. We'll make a lot of money from the fund and, and other stuff like that, but I'm I own it hundred percent. I don't intend on changing that. So James, hypothetical situation. Someone comes to you and say, James, I can make you the best pool player in the world mm -hmm. or the best poker player in the world. However, whichever one you pick, you can't play the other one ever again. Sure. Which one do you pick? Poker. All poker. Day. Poker yeah, all, day. all day. I love pool, but poker is poker's your thing. That's that's it right there. I could spend a lifetime at that table. So next back to space. Are you are you are are you the one people like believe there's other life in the universe? Or you think we're the only people with the challenge of life? Life is a, that's a broad word. Of course, it tells mean things. Of course, it tells right? life. What does that mean, right? In intelligent, complex life. First of all, I'm in the boat that says statistically, because there are literally hundreds of millions of galaxies. You only need a zero, 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 zero. You can only on think on. so high, yeah. right? And it's, it, we're literally infinitely expanding, right? So, as stars are born and die, planets are created and lost and all these different things. So we know at this point that there are the elements that we know life needs to live. We just need the four elements. What is that? Like carbon, hydrogen, oxygen, mm -hmm. nitrogen. That's mm -hmm. all you need. That's right? right. That's right. So especially with the, the launch of the James Webb telescope, obviously, is on everybody's mind right now um, that cares about space. Uh, because it is going to revolutionize what we understand about how the universe was created, but also its real deliberate task is being able to understand the atmospheres of other planets everywhere, basically, as far as, as far as we can see. And so it's just so interesting that you look at like our moon and we know our moon has no atmosphere. It's just a big rock, right? And then you look at the moons around Jupiter and they have more water than we have on earth under a you know, 15 mile ice shelf, you know, there's uh, one of the other moons is being stretched by Jupiter's gravity and there, it's volcanic. It's literally creating the core is just spitting lava all over the place. Like we, we live in a, in a crazy place that we know so freaking little about. So my answer to your question is from a statistical perspective, there is no way in my mind that simple single cell life doesn't live yeah. in the universe. Now, complex life, we know that it's very uh, statistically improbable that we're even sitting here today having this conversation, right? The fact that complex life is a, has formed took a very uh, unique lottery of uh, a lot of stars aligning yeah. for lack of a better term. Uh, and so I do believe it's very, very possible that complex, not human life, but complex alien life is out there. I just statistically, it's not probable that it doesn't. It's just so, I mean, the universe, when you really understand the scale of it is mind blowing. And there's no way in our lifetime or the next 10 generations that we could even reach some of these places. Yeah. My, I had a guest yesterday on the podcast, Miguel, I, I, I'll, uh, his company, they they ship like small satellites in space. Oh, Nice. And we just talk about how the missed opportunity that we have from like the 70s and 60s, yes. all the space program, how we just, just waste all that time, right? We talk about yeah. how, what we didn't learn, you know, talk about space, if yeah. just conversation. And then we talk about Lex Fridman before, right? Yeah. He had a Love podcast. He had a podcast where we were talking about alien stuff yep. and talk about what if aliens came. Yeah. And Lex, right? Why are we presuming they're going to talk to us, right? Right. Yeah. Like, I mean, like dolphins, ants, you right, know, right, right. Like, what, what, you know, what, what makes things like talk to us, right? Yeah. Yeah. Because so dolphins are pretty smart, you know, ants are pretty smart, you know. I, there's a lot of science smart people that have said if aliens ever kind of were in our orbit, that they'd be like, <laughs> that's what, like screw this. <laughs> that's what Lex Fremmer said. They've probably been here. It's like, no. Right, like, right, right, right. Stay like yep. they're in the no, 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 no yeah. visit zone. Like yeah. stay far away from them. Yeah. I, you know, I believe in the scientific theory. And so all, you know, there's these conspiracies about UFOs, aliens are here. I just don't see the evidence for it as possible. I, mm -hmm. you know, there's a lot of things that I don't believe are real, but there's also no evidence 
um, to say that they're not yeah. either. Like, like we're talking about Joe Rogan, he has a third, like, it's the US military war yeah. stuff, right? Yeah. America, we might remember before the South airplane came out, yeah. right? There's like uptake in UFO sightings. Right, right. They're right. doing this, they're doing, this, and then, oh, it was a South, it was South. Right? Yeah, that's right. There's, there's just too many coincidental things, and people don't question enough. And the thing too, like, if they're out here, it's all, how's it all grainy photos? Right? Yeah, that's right. That's right. Like, yeah. yeah. No one has an iPhone to take a video of it. Like, it's all grainy, like 1950. Like, come on now. Oh, I saw Bigfoot. It's just a big blur out here, you know, and, and there's a lot of things that are like that. And so again, we're back to people drinking the Kool-Aid and just not questioning things and just saying, oh, I'm going to take, like, people don't understand what the scientific method really means and how robust that system really is, what it takes to be scientific fact. Um, and look, as a human race, we, through the scientific method, have determined the method of how we determine what's real and what's not real. And so I've been watching uh, the Cosmos with Neil deGrasse Tyson recently. Love that one. Yeah. And just things don't think about like, like the person who invented like, you know, like, like who, who figured out how to plant a seed in the ground, right? Yes. Yeah. The change with that, you know. Yep. And one thing about how many people died to get us where, like, how many people like try to start a fire and burn themselves to death, right? So many. Like, how many, yeah. how many people ate poisonous mushrooms, that's right. you know? Yeah, that's right. You know, how many people like, you know, I can take a tiger out. Oh, yeah, no, you yeah, can't, right, right, right. right. Yeah. All this, like, we'll eat that. No all, all this, uh, with, like, experimentation had done in the past, that's you right. know. That's right. And now, obviously, we have a much better way to do it. Uh, but you're right. I mean, as, as the human race evolved, uh, a lot of people have learned hard lessons because nobody else had done it before. And, like, people, you know? I think people don't know how, how were the pyramids built in Egypt, right? Yeah, like, these big right, blocks, right. like, had no tools, like, yeah. tip and thing, like, like, were they just stronger than us, yeah, you know? Right, like, right, right. Like, yep. And of course, there's an episode I watched called the top 10 things in H&E or whatever. Yeah. The theory was like, they, they gave the, the people like uh, some, all the beer they wanted, right? Just yeah. crazy stories, right? It just, yeah. I mean, that's kind of, it all goes back to the fact that when we really look at history, which is a very deep topic um, in so many different ways, there's just so little we actually know. Um, you know, it's the people that I see that, really struggle with this concept the most are the ones that graduated from high school, maybe even college, and then said, okay, I, I know what I need. I'm going to go into life now. Mm -hmm. And that's where it stops. And it's like, you yeah, don't like, understand. You could learn for your lifetime and still not get it yeah, all. You got to open up to new ideas. Yeah. Yeah. That's uh, being flexible and uh, being willing. I think the biggest problem that we have is, as humans is we're not willing to see a perspective that we don't agree with. And so we're very closed minded in that way. And I, I think there's an art of putting yourself in somebody else's shoes, even if you don't agree, just to understand that perspective. And you can still, you can fully take in somebody else's uh, perspective and, and thesis and not agree with it, but still understand it. You know, and I think that's where a lot of people go wrong. They're, they're very close-minded, whether it's completely close-minded or partially close-minded. It's, again, we're back to what our DNA level core beliefs are that were built as usually kids um, and how that conflicts with the rest of the world. I think it's a lot of people, they have the same routine. Like they go to work, mm -hmm. they get off work, they cook yeah. dinner, yeah. they work three, four hours of TV. Yeah. On, on the weekend, it was, it's the same thing over and over and over again. And like, do, something, do something different. Like, it's know. easy. You know, we live in a complex world that is full of some bad shit. And so sometimes to not have to deal with any of that, it's easier just to, Let's put on Stranger Things or Game of Thrones and yeah. check out, which I love. I love both of those shows. I'm, I'm not hating on entertainment. I think that's a good thing. And there's so many things like that you can learn to paint, learn to code. I mean, right. there's so many right. things you can do to make yourself better, like Absolutely. better. Absolutely. I I have a I have a bucket list for sure. I want to learn how to play guitar like Joe Satriani. I think that would be sick. Um, definitely want to get my private pilot's license, fly around the country. You know, that would be fun. Um, you know, but all of these things, you know, I wake up every day, you know, kind of like a, I look at myself in the mirror and ask how I can be better. The other thing that I ask is, what do I want to do today? And I always view that I've got, you know, normally people have an angel and a devil on each shoulder. I feel like I just have two devils. And one of them is saying, well, do you have the time? Can you allocate the time to do that thing that you want to do? And then the second one is asking, do you have the money? You know, can, can you afford to go do that thing? And I use this extreme example, like, hey, let's go to the, you know, you know, tomorrow, let's go to Costa Rica for lunch. Um, that requires some thought about how logistically that's going to happen. Right. And so, you know, for me, again, money is a tool to give me time. And that's what I view as financial independence. 
the ability to wake up and not have those questions anymore. Those devils are, you know, for lack of a better term, I want to choke the living life out of those two devils. So I can wake up in the morning and go, what does James want to pursue today? And then go pursue it without regard for time and money. And that requires a lot of sacrifice to get there. It does. Yeah. So James, any questions I should have asked you that I didn't or anything else you want to talk about? Shoot. I think the big, you know, when it comes to entrepreneurship in my early career, I learned so many lessons the hard way. I, I think if I could speak any inspiration to anybody who's thinking about being an entrepreneur or feels like they're drawn to that, or even they're starting their, their first portion soak heavily on the 90, 10 rule, 90% preparation, 10% execution. You are going to eliminate or mitigate so much risk by that simple theory of building a strong, robust plan, hopefully with mentors and other people that already, like I focus on finding and surrounding myself with people who are already where I want to go because I learn a lot from them without having to learn the lessons that they learned the hard way. And so find, you know, that's why I appreciate what Bunker Labs does. Um, you know, the SBA score office can be helpful too. find other veterans that are entrepreneurs that have found success, that have something to share. Don't, unless you're just wildly willing to throw money and your life into the wind, don't just put both feet in the water for no reason. Build a plan, get advice. So James, I forgot I asked you this in pre-talk. Do you, do you have any like resources or gifts you want to give away? Some people do, some people don't. Hmm. I mean, I don't have anything at the top of my head, but shoot, if if you're active duty or a veteran that wants to buy a house at JBLM or Banger, I can I can give a, a pretty extreme hookup. I've I've got some partners that allow us to give away thousands of dollars in closing costs. Nice. That that can really help. So that that part I can offer value, but there's also uh, you know, if you're interested in real estate investing or really entrepreneurship in general, there is another group, uh, active duty, passive income.com that I'm connected with. Uh, we do local meetups all over the place. Um, so I think my time is something I, I could certainly give in, in, in events and stuff like that. I love talking to other brothers and sisters that want to do something bigger than themselves. And I've learned so many hard lessons that I can help other people with, you know, so time is a little bit limited, but I'd love for people to reach out connect with me on LinkedIn, Facebook, even too is fine. So James, can you share your social media link for yourself and your company so people can reach out to you? It's all, is it really all my name? So I'm, I'm sure this will be in the, in the description, but if you go to LinkedIn and, and type in James Marsluck or Facebook and type in James Marsluck, those are really my two main ones. I don't certainly don't do TikTok. Um, I don't do Instagram. I'm on Twitter, but I'm mostly just a lurker. Um, so Facebook and LinkedIn are the two best places to, to get connected. And I push out a lot of content. Um, you know, if it's not the podcast that I run, um, it's just, it's either, you know, my content is mostly space and entrepreneurship. <laughs> so if you like space or entrepreneurship, let's, let's talk. And to listeners who have the links to his gift and his social media links on the show notes, you can find the show notes at www.cavernsachallblog.com. And be sure to share this episode with your friends and uh, be sure to rate, review, and subscribe to the Ca Jason Cabin Experience on your favorite podcast platform. So James, coming in and talk, can you give us any last minute wisdom or advice on anything you want to talk about? Shoot. Think about things that are bigger than you. Put your ego aside for two seconds and, and think about finding a new 3D set of glasses that show you perspective on something new. It's, uh, I think we get in, we get in our own ways. A, a lot of the time. And I think we can do better if you're able to set that stuff aside. So put good into the world without any expectation of return and see what happens. James, thank you for being here, Dad. I really appreciate it. I really appreciate you having me, man. This was a great conversation. And to our listeners, thanks for your time as well. Remember to be great every day.